translator's introduction to hedda gobbler this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer recording by expatriate in bangor maine hedda gobbler by henrik ibsen translated by edmund gossie eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight and william archer introduction from munich on june twenty ninth eighteen ninety ibsen wrote to the swedish poet count karl snowilski our intention has all along been to spend the summer in the tyrol again but circumstances are against our doing so i am at present engaged upon a new dramatic work which for several reasons has made very slow progress and i do not leave munich until i can take with me the completed first draft there is little or no prospect of my being able to complete it in july ibsen did not leave munich at all that season on october thirtieth he wrote at present i am utterly engrossed in a new play not one leisure hour have i had for several months three weeks later november twentieth he wrote to his french translator count prosor my new play is finished the manuscript went off to copenhagen the day before yesterday it produces a curious feeling of emptiness to be thus suddenly separated from a work which has occupied one's time and thoughts for several months to the exclusion of all else but it is a good thing too to have done with it the constant intercourse with the fictitious personages was beginning to make me quite nervous to the same correspondent he wrote on december fourth the title of the play is hedda gobbler my intention in giving it this name was to indicate that hedda as a personality is to be regarded rather as her father's daughter than as her husband's wife it was not my desire to deal in this play with so-called problems what i principally wanted to do was to depict human beings human emotions and human destinies upon a groundwork of certain of the social conditions and principles of the present day so far we read the history of the play in the official correspondence some interesting glimpses into the poet's moods during the period between the completion of the lady from the sea and the publication of hedda gobbler are to be found in the series of letters to fraulein emily bardach of vienna published by dr george brandes this young lady ibsen met at gozenas in the tyrol in the autumn of eighteen eighty nine the record of their brief friendship belongs to the history of the master builder rather than to that of hedda gobbler but the allusions to his work in his letters to her during the winter of eighteen eighty nine demand some examination so early as october seventh eighteen eighty nine he writes to her a new poem begins to dawn in me i will execute it this winter and try to transfer to it the bright atmosphere of the summer but i feel that it will end in sadness such is my nature was this dawning poem had a gobbler or was it rather the master builder that was germinating in his mind who shall say the latter hypothesis seems the more probable for it is hard to believe that at any stage in the incubation of hedda gobbler he can have conceived it as even beginning in a key of gaiety a week later however he appears to have made up his mind that the time had not come for the poetic utilization of his recent experiences he writes on october fifteenth here i sit as usual at my writing-table now i would fain work but am unable to my fancy indeed is very active but it always wanders away it wanders where it has no business to wander during working hours i cannot repress my summer memories nor do i wish to i live through my experiences again and again and yet again to transmute it all into a poem i find in the meantime impossible clearly then he felt that his imagination ought to have been engaged on some theme having no relation to his summer experiences the theme no doubt of hedda gobbler in his next letter dated october twenty ninth he writes do not be troubled because i cannot in the meantime create dichten in reality i am forever creating or at any rate dreaming of something which when in the fullness of time it ripens will reveal itself as a creation dichtung on november nineteenth he says 
i am very busily occupied with preparations for my new poem i sit almost the whole day at my writing-table go out only in the evening for a little while the five following letters contain no allusion to the play but on september eighteenth eighteen ninety he wrote my wife and son are at present at riva on the lake of garda and will probably remain there until the middle of october or even longer thus i am quite alone here and cannot get away the new play on which i am at present engaged will probably not be ready until november though i sit at my writing-table daily and almost the whole day long here ends the history of hedda gobbler so far as the poet's letters carry us its hard clear outlines and perhaps somewhat bleak atmosphere seem to have resulted from a sort of reaction against the sentimental dreamery begotten of his gozenos experiences he sought refuge in the chill materialism of hedda from the ardent transcendentalism of hilda whom he already heard knocking at the door he was not yet in the mood to deal with her on the plane of poetry Note. dr julius elias neue deutsche rundschau december nineteen o six page fourteen sixty two makes the curious assertion that the character of thea elfsted was in part borrowed from this gozenasser hilde typus it is hard to see how even ibsen's ingenuity could distil from the same flower two such different essences as thea and hilda hedda gobbler was published in copenhagen on december sixteenth eighteen ninety this was the first of ibsen's plays to be translated from proof sheets and published in england and america almost simultaneously with its first appearance in scandinavia the earliest theatrical performance took place at the residence theater munich on the last day of january eighteen ninety one in the presence of the poet frau konrad ramlo playing the title part the lessing theatre berlin followed suit on february tenth not till february twenty fifth was the play seen in copenhagen with fru hennings as hedda on the following night it was given for the first time in christiania the norwegian hedda being fruken constance brun it was this production which the poet saw when he visited the christiania theatre for the first time after his return to norway august twenty eighth eighteen ninety one it would take pages to give even the baldest list of the productions and revivals of hedda gobbler in scandinavia and germany where it has always ranked among ibsen's most popular works the admirable production of the play by miss elizabeth robbins and miss marion lee at the vaudeville theatre london april twentieth eighteen ninety one may be counted the second great step towards the popularization of ibsen in england the first being the charrington Achert production of a doll's house in eighteen eighty nine miss robbins afterwards repeated her fine performance of hedda many times in london in the english provinces and in new york the character has also been acted in london by eleonora dews and as i write march fifth nineteen o seven by mrs patrick campbell at the court theatre in america hedda has frequently been acted by mrs fisk miss nance o'neill and other actresses quite recently by a russian actress madame Alla nazimova who playing in english has made a great success both in this part and in nora the first french hedda gobbler was mademoiselle marthe brandes who played the part at the vaudeville theatre paris on december seventeenth eighteen ninety one the performance being introduced by a lecture by m jules lemaitre in holland in italy in russia the play has been acted times without number in short as might easily have been foretold it has rivalled a doll's house in world-wide popularity it has been suggested i think without sufficient ground that ibsen deliberately conceived hedda gobbler as an international play and that the scene is really the west end of any great european city to me it seems quite clear that ibsen had christiania in mind and the christiania of a somewhat earlier period than the nineties the electric cars telephones and other conspicuous factors in the life of a modern capital are notably absent from the play there is no electric light in secretary falk's villa it is still the habit for ladies to return on foot from evening parties 
with gallant swains escorting them this suburbanism which so distressed the london critics of eighteen ninety one was characteristic of the christiania ibsen himself had known in the sixties the christiania of love's comedy rather than of the greatly extended and modernized city of the end of the century moreover louvborg's allusions to the fjord and the suggested picture of sheriff elfstedt his family and his avocations are all distinctively norwegian the truth seems to be very simple the environment and the subsidiary personages are all thoroughly national but hedda herself is an international type a product of civilization by no means peculiar to norway we cannot point to any individual model or models who sat to ibsen for the character of hedda note dr brahm neue deutsche rundschau december nineteen o six page fourteen twenty two says that after the first performance of hedda gobbler in berlin ibsen confided to him that the character had been suggested by a german lady whom he had met in munich and who did not shoot but poisoned herself nothing more seems to be known of this lady see to an article by julius elias in the same magazine page fourteen sixty End note. the late grant allen declared that hedda was nothing more nor less than the girl we take down to dinner in london nineteen times out of twenty in which case ibsen must have suffered from a superfluity of models rather from any difficulty in finding one but the fact is that in this as in all other instances the word model must be taken in a very different sense from that in which it is commonly used in painting ibsen undoubtedly used models for this trait and that but never for a whole figure if his characters can be called portraits at all they are composite portraits even when it seems pretty clear that the initial impulse towards the creation of a particular character came from some individual the original figure is entirely transmuted in the process of harmonization with the dramatic scheme we need not therefore look for a definite prototype of hedda but dr brandes shows that two of that lady's exploits were probably suggested by the anecdotic history of the day ibsen had no doubt heard how the wife of a well-known norwegian composer in a fit of raging jealousy excited by her husband's prolonged absence from home burnt the manuscript of a symphony which he had just finished the circumstances under which hedda burns louvborg's manuscript are of course entirely different and infinitely more dramatic but here we have merely another instance of the dramatization or poetization of the raw material of life again a still more painful incident probably came to his knowledge about the same time a beautiful and very intellectual woman was married to a well-known man who had been addicted to drink but had entirely conquered the vice one day a mad whim seized her to put his self-mastery and her power over him to the test as it happened to be his birthday she rolled into his study a small keg of brandy and then withdrew she returned some time afterwards to find that he had broached the keg and lay insensible on the floor in this anecdote we cannot but recognize the germ not only of hedda's temptation of louvborg but of a large part of her character thus says dr brandes out of small and scattered traits of reality ibsen fashioned his close-knit and profoundly thought-out works of art for the character of eilert louvborg again ibsen seems unquestionably to have borrowed several traits from a definite original a young danish man of letters whom dr brandes calls holm was an enthusiastic admirer of ibsen and came to be on very friendly terms with him one day ibsen was astonished to receive in munich a parcel addressed from berlin by this young man containing without a word of explanation a packet of his ibsen's letters and a photograph which he had presented to home ibsen brooded and brooded over the incident and at last came to the conclusion that the young man had intended to return her letters and photograph to a young lady to whom he was known to be attached and had in a fit of aberration mixed up the two objects of his worship some time after holm appeared at ibsen's rooms he talked quite rationally 
but professed to have no knowledge whatever of the latter incident though he admitted the truth of ibsen's conjecture that the belle dame sans merci had demanded the return of her letters and portrait ibsen was determined to get at the root of the mystery and a little inquiry into his young friend's habits revealed the fact that he broke his fast on a bottle of port wine consumed a bottle of rhine wine at lunch a burgundy at dinner and finished off the evening with one or two more bottles of port then he heard too how in the course of a night's carouse holm had lost the manuscript of a book and in these traits he saw the outline of the figure of eilert Lufborg. some time elapsed and again ibsen received a postal packet from holm this one contained his will in which ibsen figured as his residuary legatee but many other legatees were mentioned in the instrument all of them ladies such as fräulein alma rockbart of bremen and fräulein elise kraushaar of berlin the bequests to these meritorious spinsters were so generous that their sum considerably exceeded the amount of the testator's property ibsen gently but firmly declined the proffered inheritance but holmes's will no doubt suggested to him the figure of that red-haired mademoiselle diana who is heard of but not seen in hedda gobbler and enabled him to add some further traits to the portraiture of Lufborg. when the play appeared holm recognized himself with glee in the character of the bibulous man of letters and thereafter adopted eilert Lufborg as his pseudonym i do not therefore see why dr brandes should suppress his real name but i willingly imitate him in erring on the side of discretion the poor fellow died several years ago some critics have been greatly troubled as to the precise meaning of hedda's fantastic vision of Lufborg with vine leaves in his hair surely this is a very obvious image or symbol of the beautiful the ideal aspect of bacchic elation and revelry antique art or i am much mistaken shows us many figures of dionysus himself and his followers with vine leaves entwined in their hair to ibsen's mind at any rate the image had long been familiar in per gint act four scene eight when per having carried off anitra finds himself in a particularly festive mood he cries were there vine leaves around i would garland my brow again in emperor and galilean part two act one where julian in the procession of dionysus impersonates the god himself it is directed that he shall wear a wreath of vine leaves professor dietrichson relates that among the young artists whose society ibsen frequented during his first years in rome it was customary at their little festivals for the revellers to deck themselves in this fashion but the image is so obvious that there is no need to trace it to any personal experience the attempt to place hedda's vine leaves among ibsen's obscurities is an example of the firm resolution not to understand which animated the criticism of the nineties dr brandes has dealt very severely with the character of eilert Lufborg, alleging that we cannot believe in the genius attributed to him but where is he described as a genius the poet represents him as a very able student of sociology but that is a quite different thing from attributing to him such genius as must necessarily shine forth in every word he utters dr brandes indeed declines to believe even in his ability as a sociologist on the ground that it is idle to write about the social development of the future to our prosaic minds he says it may seem as if the most sensible utterance on the subject is that of the fool of the play the future good heavens we know nothing of the future the best retort to this criticism is that which eilert himself makes there's a thing or two to be said about it all the same the intelligent forecasting of the future as mr h g wells has shown is not only clearly distinguishable from fantastic utopianism but is indispensable to any large statesmanship or enlightened social activity with very real and very great respect for dr brandes i cannot think that he has been fortunate in his treatment of Lufborg's character it has been represented as an absurdity that he should think of reading extract from his new book to a man like tesman whom he despises but though tesman is a ninny he is as hedda says a specialist 
he is a competent plodding student of his subject lovborg may quite naturally wish to see how his new method or his excursion into a new field strikes the average scholar of the tesman type he is in fact trying it on the dog neither an unreasonable nor an unusual proceeding there is no doubt a certain improbability in the way in which lovborg is represented as carrying his manuscript around and especially in mrs elfstedt's production of his rough draft from her pocket but these are mechanical trifles on which only a niggling criticism would dream of laying stress of all ibsen's works hedda gobbler is the most detached the most objective a character study pure and simple it is impossible or so it seems to me to extract any sort of general idea from it one cannot even call it a satire unless one is prepared to apply that term to the record of a case in a work on criminology reverting to dumas dictum that a play should contain a painting a judgment an ideal we may say that hedda gobbler fulfils only the first of these requirements the poet does not even pass judgment on his heroine he simply paints her full-length portrait with scientific impassivity but what a portrait how searching in insight how brilliant in colouring how rich in detail grant allen's remark above quoted was of course a whimsical exaggeration the hedda type is not so common as all that else the world would quickly come to an end but particular traits and tendencies of the hedda type are very common in modern life and not only among women hyperesthesia lies at the root of her tragedy with a keenly critical relentlessly solvent intelligence she combines a morbid shrinking from all the gross and prosaic detail of the sensual life she has nothing to take her out of herself not a single intellectual interest or moral enthusiasm she cherishes in a languid way a petty social ambition and even that she finds obstructed and baffled at the same time she learns that another woman has had the courage to love and venture all where she in her cowardice only hankered and refrained her malign egoism rises up uncontrolled and calls to its aid her quick and subtle intellect she ruins the other woman's happiness but in doing so incurs a danger from which her sense of personal dignity revolts life has no such charm for her that she cares to purchase it at the cost of squalid humiliation and self-contempt the good and the bad in her alike impel her to have done with it all and a pistol-shot ends what is surely one of the most poignant character tragedies in literature ibsen's brain never worked at higher pressure than in the conception and adjustment of those crowded hours in which hedda tangled in the web of will and circumstance struggles on till she is too weary to struggle any more it may not be superfluous to note that the a in gobbler should be sounded long and full like the a in garden not like the a in gable or in gabble end of translator's introduction recording by expatriate in bangor maine act one of hedda gobbler by henrik ibsen translated by edmund gossie eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight and william archer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine characters george tesman hedda tesman his wife miss juliana tesman his aunt mrs elfstead judge brock eilert lovborg berta servant at the tesmans the scene of the action is tesman's villa in the west end of christiania note tesman whose christian name in the original is jurgen is described as a stipendia cultur historia that is to say the holder of a scholarship for purposes of research into the history of civilization End note. hedda gobbler play in four acts act first a spacious handsome and tastefully furnished drawing-room decorated in dark colours 
in the back a wide doorway with curtains drawn back leading into a smaller room decorated in the same style as the drawing-room in the right-hand wall of the front room a folding door leading out to the hall in the opposite wall on the left a glass door also with curtains drawn back through the panes can be seen part of a veranda outside and trees covered with autumn foliage an oval table with a cover on it and surrounded by chairs stands well forward in front by the wall on the right a wide stove of dark porcelain a high-backed armchair a cushioned footrest and two footstools a settee with a small round table in front of it fills the upper right-hand corner in front on the left a little way from the wall a sofa further back than the glass door a piano on either side of the doorway at the back a whatnot with terracotta and majolica ornaments against the back wall of the inner room a sofa with a table and one or two chairs over the sofa hangs the portrait of a handsome elderly man in a general's uniform over the table a hanging lamp with an opal glass shade a number of bouquets are arranged about the drawing-room in vases and glasses others lie upon the tables the floors in both rooms are covered with thick carpets morning light the sun shines in through the glass door miss juliana tesman with her bonnet on and carrying a parasol comes in from the hall followed by berta who carries a bouquet wrapped in paper miss tesman is a comely and pleasant-looking lady of about sixty-five she is nicely but simply dressed in a grey walking costume berta is a middle-aged woman of plain and rather countrified appearance miss tesman stops close to the door listens and says softly upon my word i don't believe they are stirring yet berta also softly i told you so miss remember how late the steamboat got in last night and then when they got home good lord what a lot the young mistress had to unpack before she could get to bed miss tesman well well let them have their sleep out but let us see that they get a good breath of the fresh morning air when they do appear she goes to the glass door and throws it open berta beside the table at a loss what to do with the bouquet in her hand i declare there isn't a bit of room left i think i'll put it down here miss she places it on the piano miss tesman so you've got a new mistress now my dear berta heaven knows it was a wrench to me to part with you berta on the point of weeping and do you think it wasn't hard for me too miss after all the blessed years i've been with you and miss rena miss tesman we must make the best of it berta there was nothing else to be done george can't do without you you see he absolutely can't he has had you to look after him ever since he was a little boy berta ah but miss julia i can't help thinking of miss rena lying helpless at home there poor thing and with only that new girl too she'll never learn to take proper care of an invalid miss tesman oh i shall manage to train her and of course you know i shall take most of it upon myself you needn't be uneasy about my poor sister my dear berta berta well but there's another thing miss i'm so mortally afraid i shan't be able to suit the young mistress miss tesman oh well just at first there may be one or two things berta most like she'll be terrible grand in her ways miss tesman well you can't wonder at that general gobbler's daughter think of the sort of life she was accustomed to in her father's time don't you remember how we used to see her riding down the road along with the general in that long black habit and with feathers in her hat berta yes indeed i remember well enough but good lord i should never have dreamt in those days that she and master george would make a match of it miss tesman nor i but by the by berta while i think of it in future you mustn't say master george you must say dr tesman berta yes the young mistress spoke of that too last night the moment they set foot in the house is it true then miss miss tesman yes indeed it is only think berta some foreign university has made him a doctor while he has been abroad you understand 
i hadn't heard a word about it until he told me himself upon the pier berta well well he's clever enough for anything he is but i didn't think he'd have gone in for doctoring people too miss tesman no no it's not that sort of doctor he is nods significantly but let me tell you we may have to call him something still grander before long berta you don't say so what can that be miss miss tesman smiling hm wouldn't you like to know with emotion ah dear dear if my poor brother could only look up from his grave now and see what his little boy has grown into looks around but bless me berta why have you done this taking the chintz covers off all the furniture berta the mistress told me to she can't abide covers on the chairs she says miss tesman are they going to make this their everyday sitting-room then berta yes that's what i understood from the mistress master george the doctor he said nothing george tesman comes from the right into the inner room humming to himself and carrying an unstrapped empty portmanteau he is a middle-sized young-looking man of thirty-three rather stout with a round open cheerful face fair hair and beard he wears spectacles and is somewhat carelessly dressed in comfortable indoor clothes miss tesman good morning good morning george tesman in the doorway between the rooms aunt yulia dear aunt yulia goes up to her and shakes hands warmly come all this way so early eh miss tesman why of course i had to come and see how you were getting on tesman in spite of your having had no proper night's rest miss tesman oh that makes no difference to me tesman well i suppose you got home all right from the pier eh miss tesman yes quite safely thank goodness judge brock was good enough to see me right to my door tesman we were so sorry we couldn't give you a seat in the carriage but you saw what a pile of boxes hedda had to bring with her miss tesman yes she had certainly plenty of boxes berta to tesman shall i go in and see if there's anything i can do for the mistress tesman no thank you berta you needn't she said she would ring if she wanted anything berta going towards the right very well tesman but look here take this portmanteau with you berta taking it i'll put it in the attic she goes out by the hall door tesman fancy auntie i had the whole of that portmanteau chock full of copies of documents you wouldn't believe how much i have picked up from all the archives i have been examining curious old details that no one has had any idea of miss tesman yes you don't seem to have wasted your time on your wedding trip george tesman no that i haven't but do take off your bonnet auntie look here let me untie the strings eh miss tesman while he does so well well this is just as if you were still at home with us tesman with the bonnet in his hand looks at it from all sides why what a gorgeous bonnet you've been investing in miss tesman i bought it on hedda's account tesman on hedda's account eh miss tesman yes so that hedda needn't be ashamed of me if we happen to go out together tesman patting her cheek you always think of everything aunt yulia lays the bonnet on a chair beside the table and now look here suppose we sit comfortably on the sofa and have a little chat till hedda comes they seat themselves she places her parasol in the corner of the sofa miss tesman takes both his hands and looks at him what a delight it is to have you again as large as life before my very eyes george my george my poor brother's own boy tesman and it's a delight for me too to see you again aunt yulia you who have been father and mother in one to me miss tesman oh yes i know you will always keep a place in your heart for your old aunts tesman and what about aunt rena no improvement eh miss tesman oh no we can scarcely look for any improvement in her case poor thing there she lies helpless as she has lain for all these years but heaven grant i may not lose her yet a while for if i did i don't know what i should make of my life george especially now that i haven't you to look after any more 
tesman patting her back there 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 miss tesman suddenly changing her tone and to think that here are you a married man george and that you should be the one to carry off hedda gobbler the beautiful hedda gobbler only think of it she that was so beset with admirers tesman hums a little and smiles complacently yes i fancy i have several good friends about town who would like to stand in my shoes eh miss tesman and then this fine long wedding tour you have had more than five nearly six months tesman well for me it has been a sort of tour of research as well i have had to do so much grubbing among old records and to read no end of books too auntie miss tesman oh yes i suppose so more confidentially and lowering her voice a little but listen now george have you nothing nothing special to tell me tesman as to our journey miss tesman yes tesman no i don't know of anything except what i have told you in my letters i had a doctor's degree conferred on me but that i told you yesterday miss tesman yes yes you did but what i mean is haven't you any any expectations tesman expectations miss tesman why you know george i'm your old auntie tesman why of course i have expectations miss tesman ah tesman i have every expectation of being a professor one of these days miss tesman oh yes a professor tesman indeed i may say i am certain of it but my dear auntie you know all about that already miss tesman laughing to herself yes of course i do you are quite right there changing the subject but we were talking about your journey it must have cost a great deal of money george tesman well you see my handsome travelling scholarship went a good way miss tesman but i can't understand how you can have made it go far enough for two tesman no that's not so easy to understand eh miss tesman and especially travelling with a lady they tell me that makes it ever so much more expensive tesman yes of course it makes it a little more expensive but hedda had to have this trip auntie she really had to nothing else would have done miss tesman no no i suppose not a wedding tour seems to be quite indispensable nowadays but tell me now have you gone thoroughly over the house yet tesman yes you may be sure i have i have been afoot ever since daylight miss tesman and what do you think of it all tesman oh i'm delighted quite delighted only i can't think what we are to do with the two empty rooms between this inner parlour and hedda's bedroom miss tesman laughing oh my dear george i dare say you may find some use for them in the course of time tesman why of course you are quite right aunt yulia you mean as my library increases eh miss tesman yes quite so my dear boy it was your library i was thinking of tesman i am specially pleased on hedda's account often and often before we were engaged she said that she would never care to live anywhere but in secretary falk's villa Note, in the original Staatsrandende Fox Villa, showing that it had belonged to the widow of a cabinet minister. End note. Miss Tesman, yes, it was lucky that this very house should come into the market just after you had started. Tesman, yes, Aunt Yulia, the luck was on our side, wasn't it, eh? Miss Tesman, but the expense, my dear George, you will find it very expensive, all this. Tesman, looks at her a little cast down yes i suppose i shall aunt miss tesman oh frightfully tesman how much do you think in round numbers eh miss tesman oh i can't even guess until all the accounts come in tesman well fortunately judge brock has secured the most favourable terms for me so he said in a letter to hedda miss tesman yes don't be uneasy my dear boy besides i have given security for the furniture and all the carpets tesman security you my dear aunt yulia what sort of security could you give miss tesman i have given a mortgage on our annuity 
tesman jumps up what on your and aunt rina's annuity miss tesman yes i knew of no other plan you see tesman placing himself before her have you gone out of your senses auntie your annuity it's all that you and aunt rina have to live upon miss tesman well well don't get so excited about it it's only a matter of form you know judge brock assured me of that it was he that was kind enough to arrange the whole affair for me a mere matter of form he said tesman yes that may be all very well but nevertheless miss tesman you will have your own salary to depend upon now and good heavens even if we did have to pay up a little to eke things out a bit at the start why it would be nothing but a pleasure to us tesman oh auntie will you never be tired of making sacrifices for me miss tesman rises and lays her hand on his shoulders have i any other happiness in this world except to smooth your way for you my dear boy you who have had neither father nor mother to depend on and now we have reached the goal george things have looked black enough for us sometimes but thank heaven now you have nothing to fear tesman yes it is really marvellous how everything has turned out for the best miss tesman and the people who opposed you who wanted to bar the way for you now you have them at your feet they have fallen george your most dangerous rival his fall was the worst and now he has to lie on the bed he has made for himself poor misguided creature tesman have you heard anything of eilert since i went away i mean miss tesman only that he is said to have published a new book tesman what eilert lovborg recently eh miss tesman yes so they say heaven knows whether it can be worth anything ah oh, when your new book appears that will be another story george what is it to be about tesman it will deal with the domestic industries of brabant during the middle ages miss tesman fancy to be able to write on such a subject as that tesman however it may be some time before the book is ready i have all these collections to arrange first you see miss tesman yes collecting and arranging no one can beat you at that there you are my poor brother's own son tesman i am looking forward eagerly to setting to work at it especially now that i have my own delightful home to work in miss tesman and most of all now that you have got the wife of your heart my dear george tesman embracing her oh yes yes aunt julia hedda she is the best part of it all looks towards the doorway i believe i hear her coming eh hedda enters from the left through the inner room she is a woman of nine and twenty her face and figure show refinement and distinction her complexion is pale and opaque her steel-grey eyes express a cold unruffled repose her hair is of an agreeable medium brown but not particularly abundant she is dressed in a tasteful somewhat loose-fitting morning gown miss tesman going to meet hedda good morning my dear hedda good morning and a hearty welcome hedda holds out her hand good morning dear miss tesman so early a call that is kind of you miss tesman with some embarrassment well has the bride slept well in her new home hedda oh yes thanks passably tesman laughing passably come that's good hedda you were sleeping like a stone when i got up hedda fortunately of course one has always to accustom oneself to new surroundings miss tesman little by little looking towards the left oh there the servant has gone and opened the veranda door and let in a whole flood of sunshine miss tesman going towards the door well then we will shut it hedda no no not that tesman please draw the curtains that will give a softer light tesman at the door all right all right there now hedda now you have both shade and fresh air hedda yes fresh air we certainly must have with all these stacks of flowers but won't you sit down miss tesman miss tesman no thank you now that i have seen that everything is all right here thank heaven i must be getting home again 
my sister is lying longing for me poor thing tesman give her my very best love auntie and say i shall look in and see her later in the day miss tesman yes yes i'll be sure to tell her but by the by george feeling in her dress pocket i had almost forgotten i have something for you here tesman what is it auntie eh miss tesman produces a flat parcel wrapped in newspaper and hands it to him look here my dear boy tesman opening the parcel well i declare have you really saved them for me aunt yulia hedda isn't this touching eh hedda beside the what-not on the right well what is it tesman my old morning shoes my slippers hedda indeed i remember you often spoke of them while we were abroad tesman yes i miss them terribly goes up to her now you shall see them hedda hedda going towards the stove thanks i really don't care about it tesman following her only think ill as she was aunt rena embroidered these for me oh you can't think how many associations cling to them hedda at the table well scarcely for me miss tesman of course not for hedda george tesman well but now that she belongs to the family i thought hedda interrupting we shall never get on with this servant tesman miss tesman not get on with berta tesman why dear what puts that in your head eh hedda pointing look there she has left her old bonnet lying about on a chair tesman in consternation drops the slippers on the floor why hedda hedda just fancy if any one should come in and see it tesman but hedda that's aunt yulia's bonnet hedda is it miss tesman taking up the bonnet yes indeed it's mine and what's more it's not old madam hedda hedda i really did not look closely at it miss tesman miss tesman trying on the bonnet let me tell you it's the first time i have worn it the very first time tesman and a very nice bonnet it is too quite a beauty miss tesman oh it's no such great things george looks around her my parasol ah here takes it for this is mine too mutters not berta's tesman a new bonnet and a new parasol only think hedda hedda very handsome indeed tesman yes isn't it eh but auntie take a good look at hedda before you go see how handsome she is miss tesman oh my dear boy there's nothing new in that hedda was always lovely she nods and goes towards the right tesman following yes but have you noticed what splendid condition she is in how she is filled out on the journey hedda crossing the room oh do be quiet miss tesman who has stopped and turned filled out tesman of course you don't notice it so much now that she has that dress on but i who can see hedda at the glass door impatiently oh you can't see anything tesman it must be the mountain air in the tyrol hedda curtly interrupting i am exactly as i was when i started tesman so you insist but i'm quite certain you are not don't you agree with me auntie miss tesman who has been gazing at her with folded hands hedda is lovely 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 goes up to her takes her head between both hands draws it downwards and kisses her hair god bless and preserve hedda tesman for george's sake hedda gently freeing herself oh let me go miss tesman in quiet emotion i shall not let a day pass without coming to see you tesman no you won't will you auntie eh miss tesman good-bye good-bye she goes out by the hall door tesman accompanies her the door remains half open tesman can be heard repeating his message to aunt rena and his thanks for the slippers in the meantime hedda walks about the room raising her arms and clenching her hands as if in desperation then she flings back the curtains from the glass door and stands there looking out presently tesman returns and closes the door behind him tesman picks up the slippers from the floor what are you looking at hedda hedda once more calm and mistress of herself 
i am only looking at the leaves they are so yellow so withered tesman wraps up the slippers and lays them on the table well you see we are well into september now hedda again restless yes to think of it already in in september tesman don't you think aunt yulia's manner was strange dear almost solemn can you imagine what was the matter with her eh hedda i scarcely know her you see is she not often like that tesman no not as she was to-day hedda leaving the glass door you think she was annoyed about the bonnet tesman oh scarcely at all perhaps a little just at the moment hedda but what an idea to pitch her bonnet about in the drawing-room no one does that sort of thing tesman well you may be sure aunt yulia won't do it again hedda in any case i shall manage to make my peace with her tesman yes my dear good hedda if you only would hedda when you call this afternoon you might invite her to spend the evening here tesman yes that i will and there's one thing more you could do that would delight her heart hedda what is it tesman if you could only prevail on yourself to say do to her for my sake hedda eh note do equals thou tesman means if you could persuade yourself to to toye her hedda no no tesman you really mustn't ask that of me i have told you so already i shall try to call her aunt and you must be satisfied with that tesman well well only i think now that you belong to the family you hedda hm. i can't in the least see why she goes up towards the middle doorway tesman after a pause is there anything the matter with you hedda eh hedda i'm only looking at my old piano it doesn't go at all well with all the other things tesman the first time i draw my salary we'll see about exchanging it hedda no 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 exchanging i don't want to part with it suppose we put it there in the inner room and then get another here in its place when it's convenient i mean tesman a little taken aback well yes of course we could do that hedda takes up the bouquet from the piano these flowers were not here last night when we arrived tesman aunt yulia must have brought them for you hedda examining the bouquet a visiting card takes it out and reads shall return later in the day can you guess whose card it is tesman no whose eh hedda the name is mrs elfsted tesman is it really sheriff elfsted's wife miss risling that was hedda exactly the girl with the irritating hair that she was always showing off an old flame of yours i've been told tesman laughing oh that didn't last long and it was before i knew you hedda but fancy her being in town hedda it's odd that she should call upon us i have scarcely seen her since we left school tesman i haven't seen her either for heaven knows how long i wonder how she can endure to live in such an out-of-the-way hole eh hedda after a moment's thought says suddenly tell me tesman isn't it somewhere near here that he that eilert lutborg is living tesman yes he is somewhere in that part of the country berta enters by the hall door berta that lady ma'am that brought some flowers a little while ago is here again pointing the flowers you have in your hand ma'am hedda ah is she well please show her in berta opens the door for mrs elfsted and goes out herself mrs elfsted is a woman of fragile figure with pretty soft features her eyes are light blue large round and somewhat prominent with a startled inquiring expression her hair is remarkably light almost flaxen and unusually abundant and wavy she is a couple of years younger than hedda she wears a dark visiting dress tasteful but not quite in the latest fashion hedda receives her warmly how do you do my dear mrs elfsted it's delightful to see you again mrs elfsted nervously struggling for self-control yes it's a very long time since we met tesman gives her his hand and we too eh hedda thanks for your lovely flowers mrs elfsted oh not at all 
i would have come straight here yesterday afternoon but i heard that you were away tesman have you just come to town eh mrs elvsted i arrived yesterday about midday oh i was quite in despair when i heard that you were not at home hedda in despair how so tesman why my dear mrs rising i mean mrs elvsted hedda i hope that you are not in any trouble mrs elvsted yes i am and i don't know another living creature here that i can turn to hedda laying the bouquet on the table come let us sit here on the sofa mrs elvsted oh i am too restless to sit down hedda oh no you're not come here she draws mrs elvsted down upon the sofa and sits at her side tesman well what is it mrs elvsted hedda has anything particular happened to you at home mrs elvsted yes and no oh i am so anxious you should not misunderstand me hedda then your best plan is to tell us the whole story mrs elvsted tesman i suppose that's what you have come for eh mrs elvsted yes yes of course it is well then i must tell you if you don't already know that eilert lovborg is in town too hedda lovborg tesman what has eilert lovborg come back fancy that hedda hedda well well i hear it mrs elvsted he has been here a week already just fancy a whole week in this terrible town alone with so many temptations on all sides hedda but my dear mrs elvsted how does he concern you so much mrs elvsted looks at her with a startled air and says rapidly he was the children's tutor hedda your children's mrs elvsted my husband's i have none hedda your stepchildren's then mrs elvsted yes tesman somewhat hesitatingly then was he i don't know how to express it was he regular enough in his habits to be fit for the post eh mrs elvsted for the last two years his conduct has been irreproachable tesman has it indeed fancy that hedda hedda i hear it mrs elvsted perfectly irreproachable i assure you in every respect but all the same now that i know he is here in this great town and with a large sum of money in his hands i can't help being in mortal fear for him tesman why did he not remain where he was with you and your husband eh mrs elvsted after his book was published he was too restless and unsettled to remain with us tesman yes by the by aunt yulia told me he had published a new book mrs elvsted yes a big book dealing with the march of civilization in broad outline as it were it came out about a fortnight ago and since it has sold so well and been so much read and made such a sensation tesman has it indeed it must be something he has had lying by since his better days mrs elvsted long ago you mean tesman yes mrs elvsted no he has written it all since he has been with us within the last year tesman isn't that good news hedda think of that mrs elvsted ah yes if only it would last hedda have you seen him here in town mrs elvsted no not yet i have had the greatest difficulty in finding out his address but this morning i discovered it at last hedda looks searchingly at her do you know it seems to me a little odd of your husband mm. mrs elvsted starting nervously of my husband what hedda that he should send you to town on such an errand that he does not come himself and look after his friend mrs elvsted oh no no my husband has no time and besides i i had some shopping to do hedda with a slight smile ah that is a different matter mrs elvsted rising quickly and uneasily and now i beg and implore you mr tesman receive eilert lovborg kindly if he comes to see you and that he is sure to do you see you were such great friends in the old days and then you are interested in the same studies the same branch of science so far as i can understand tesman we used to be at any rate mrs elvsted that is why i beg so earnestly that you you too will keep a sharp eye upon him 
Oh, you will promise me that, Mr. Tesman, won't you? Tesman. With the greatest of pleasure, Mrs. Riesing. Hedda. Elfsted. Tesman. I assure you, I shall do all I possibly can for Eilert. You may rely upon me. Mrs. Elfsted. Oh, how very, very kind of you. Presses his hands. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Frightened. You see, my husband is so very fond of him. Hedda, rising. You ought to write to him, Tesman. Perhaps he may not care to come to you of his own accord. Tesman. Well, perhaps it would be the right thing to do, Hedda. Eh? Hedda. And the sooner the better. Why not at once? Mrs. Elfsted imploringly. Oh, if you only would. Tesman. I'll write this moment. Have you his address, Mrs. Mrs. Elfsted? Mrs. Elfsted. Yes. Takes a slip of paper from her pocket and hands it to him. Here it is. Tesman. Good. Good. Then I'll go in. Looks about him. By the by, my slippers. Oh, here. Takes the packet and is about to go. Hedda. Be sure you write him a cordial, friendly letter, and a good long one, too. Tesman. Yes, I will. Mrs. Elfsted. But please, please don't say a word to show that I have suggested it. Tesman. No. How could you think I would, eh? He goes out to the right through the inner room. Hedda goes up to Mrs. Elfsted, smiles, and says in a low voice, There, we have killed two birds with one stone. Mrs. Elfsted. What do you mean? Hedda. Could you not see that I wanted him to go? Mrs. Elfsted. Yes, to write the letter. Hedda. And that I might speak to you alone. Mrs. Elfsted, confused. About the same thing? Hedda. Precisely mrs elfsted apprehensively but there is nothing more mrs tesman absolutely nothing hedda oh yes but there is there is a great deal more i can see that sit here and we'll have a cosy confidential chat she forces mrs elfsted to sit in the easy chair beside the stove and seats herself on one of the footstools mrs elfsted anxiously looking at her watch but my dear mrs tesman i was really on the point of going hedda oh you can't be in such a hurry well now tell me something about your life at home mrs elfsted oh that is just what i care least to speak about hedda but to me dear why weren't we schoolfellows mrs elfsted yes but you were in the class above me oh how dreadfully afraid of you i was then hedda afraid of me mrs elfsted yes dreadfully for when we met on the stairs you used always to pull my hair hedda did i really mrs elfsted yes and once you said you would burn it off my head hedda oh that was all nonsense of course mrs elfsted yes but i was so silly in those days and since then too we have drifted so far far apart from each other our circles have been so entirely different hedda well then we must try to drift together again now listen at school we said do to each other and we called each other by our christian names mrs elfsted no i am sure you must be mistaken hedda no not at all i can remember quite distinctly so now we are going to renew our old friendship draws the footstool closer to mrs elfsted there now kisses her cheek you must say do to me and call me hedda mrs elfsted presses and pats her hands oh how good and kind you are i am not used to such kindness hedda there 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 and i shall say do to you as in the old days and call you my dear tora mrs elfsted my name is thea hedda why of course i meant thea looks at her compassionately so you are not accustomed to goodness and kindness thea not in your own home mrs elfsted oh if i only had a home but i haven't any i have never had a home hedda looks at her for a moment i almost suspected as much mrs elfsted gazing helplessly before her yes 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 hedda i don't quite remember was it not as housekeeper that you first went to mr elfsted's mrs elfsted i really went as governess but his wife his late wife 
was an invalid and rarely left her room so i had to look after the housekeeping as well hedda and then at last you became mistress of the house mrs elvsted sadly yes i did hedda let me see about how long ago was that mrs elvsted my marriage hedda yes mrs elvsted five years ago hedda to be sure it must be that mrs elvsted oh those five years or at all events the last two or three of them oh if you could only imagine note mrs elvsted here uses the formal pronoun de whereupon hedda rebukes her in her next speech mrs elvsted says do End note. hedda giving her a little slap on the hand de feithea mrs elvsted yes yes i will try well if you could only imagine and understand hedda lightly eilert lovborg has been in your neighbourhood about three years hasn't he mrs elvsted looks at her doubtfully eilert lovborg yes he has hedda had you known him before in town here mrs elvsted well scarcely at all i mean i knew him by name of course hedda but you saw a good deal of him in the country mrs elvsted well yes he came to us every day you see he gave the children lessons for in the long run i couldn't manage it all myself hedda no that's clear and your husband i suppose he is often away from home mrs elvsted yes being sheriff you know he has to travel about a good deal in his district hedda leaning against the arm of the chair Thea my poor sweet thea now you must tell me everything exactly as it stands mrs elvsted well then you must question me hedda what sort of a man is your husband thea i mean you know in everyday life is he kind to you mrs elvsted evasively i am sure he means well in everything hedda i should think he must be altogether too old for you there is at least twenty years difference between you is there not mrs elvsted irritably yes that is true too everything about him is repellent to me we have not a thought in common we have no single point of sympathy he and i hedda but is he not fond of you all the same in his own way mrs elvsted oh i really don't know i think he regards me simply as a useful property and then it doesn't cost much to keep me i am not expensive hedda that is stupid of you mrs elvsted shakes her head it cannot be otherwise not with him i don't think he really cares for any one but himself and perhaps a little for the children hedda and for eilert lovborg thea mrs elvsted looking at her for eilert lovborg what puts that into your head hedda well my dear i should say when he sends you after him all the way to town smiling almost imperceptibly and besides you said so yourself to tesman mrs elvsted with a little nervous twitch did i well yes i suppose i did vehemently but not loudly no i may just as well make a clean breast of it at once for it must all come out in any case hedda why my dear thea mrs elvsted well to make a long story short my husband did not know that i was coming hedda what your husband didn't know it mrs elvsted no of course not for that matter he was away from home himself he was travelling oh i could bear it no longer hedda i couldn't indeed so utterly alone as i should have been in future hedda well and then mrs elvsted so i put together some of my things what i needed most as quietly as possible and then i left the house hedda without a word mrs elvsted yes and took the train straight to town hedda why my dear good thea to think of you daring to do it mrs elvsted rises and moves about the room what else could i possibly do hedda but what do you think your husband will say when you go home again mrs elvsted at the table looks at her back to him hedda of course mrs elvsted i shall never go back to him again hedda rising and going towards her then you have left your home for good and all 
mrs elvsted yes there was nothing else to be done hedda but then to take flight so openly mrs elvsted oh it's impossible to keep things of that sort secret hedda but what do you think people will say of you thea mrs elvsted they may say what they like for aught i care seats herself wearily and sadly on the sofa i have done nothing but what i had to do hedda after a short silence and what are your plans now what do you think of doing mrs elvsted i don't know yet i only know this that i must live here where eilert lovborg is if i am to live at all hedda takes a chair from the table seats herself beside her and strokes her hands my dear thea how did this this friendship between you and eilert lovborg come about mrs elvsted oh it grew up gradually i gained a sort of influence over him hedda indeed mrs elvsted he gave up his old habits not because i asked him to for i never dared do that but of course he saw how repulsive they were to me and so he dropped them hedda concealing an involuntary smile of scorn then you have reclaimed him as the saying goes my little thea mrs elvsted well so he says himself at any rate and he on his side has made a real human being of me taught me to think and to understand so many things hedda did he give you lessons too then mrs elvsted well no not exactly lessons but he talked to me talked about such an infinity of things and then came the lovely happy time when i began to share in his work when he allowed me to help him hedda oh he did did he mrs elvsted yes he never wrote anything without my assistance hedda you were two good comrades in fact mrs elvsted eagerly comrades yes fancy hedda that is the very word he used oh i ought to feel perfectly happy and yet i cannot for i don't know how long it will last hedda are you no surer of him than that mrs elvsted gloomily a woman's shadow stands between eilert lovborg and me hedda looks at her anxiously who can that be mrs elvsted i don't know someone he knew in his in his past someone he has never been able wholly to forget hedda what has he told you about this mrs elvsted he has only once quite vaguely alluded to it hedda well and what did he say mrs elvsted he said that when they parted she threatened to shoot him with a pistol hedda with cold composure oh nonsense no one does that sort of thing here mrs elvsted no and that is why i think it must have been that red-haired singing woman whom he wants hedda yes very likely mrs elvsted for i remember they used to say of her that she carried loaded firearms hedda oh then of course it must have been she mrs elvsted wringing her hands and now just fancy hedda i hear that this singing woman that she is in town again oh i don't know what to do hedda glancing towards the inner room hush here comes tesman rises and whispers thea all this must remain between you and me mrs elvsted springing up oh yes yes for heaven's sake george tesman with a letter in his hand comes from the right through the inner room tesman there now the epistle is finished hedda that's right and now mrs elvsted is just going wait a moment i'll go with you to the garden gate tesman do you think berta could post the letter hedda dear hedda takes it i will tell her to berta enters from the hall berta judge brock wishes to know if mrs tesman will receive him hedda yes ask judge brock to come in and look here put this letter in the post berta taking the letter yes ma'am she opens the door for judge brock and goes out herself brock is a man of forty-five thick-set but well built and elastic in his movements his face is roundish with an aristocratic profile his hair is short still almost black and carefully dressed his eyes are lively and sparkling his eyebrows thick his moustaches are also thick with short-cut ends he wears a well-cut walking-suit a little too youthful for his age 
he uses an eyeglass which he now and then lets drop judge brock with his hat in his hand bowing may one venture to call so early in the day hedda of course one may tesman presses his hand you are welcome at any time introducing him judge brock miss rising hedda oh brock bowing ah delighted hedda looks at him and laughs it's nice to have a look at you by daylight judge brock do you find me altered hedda a little younger i think brock oh thank you so much tesman but what do you think of hedda eh doesn't she look flourishing she is actually hedda oh do leave me alone you haven't thanked judge brock for all the trouble he has taken brock oh nonsense it was a pleasure to me hedda yes you are a friend indeed but here stands thea all impatience to be off so au revoir judge i shall be back again presently mutual salutations mrs elvsted and hedda go out by the hall door brock well is your wife tolerably satisfied tesman oh yes we can't thank you sufficiently of course she talks of a little rearrangement here and there and one or two things are still wanting we shall have to buy some additional trifles brock indeed tesman but we won't trouble you about these things hedda says she herself will look after what is wanting shan't we sit down eh brock thanks for a moment seats himself beside the table there is something i wanted to speak to you about my dear tesman tesman indeed ah i understand seating himself i suppose it's the serious part of the frolic that is coming now eh brock oh the money question is not so very pressing though for that matter i wish we had gone a little more economically to work tesman but that would never have done you know think of hedda my dear fellow you who know her so well i couldn't possibly ask her to put up with a shabby style of living brock no no that is just the difficulty tesman and then fortunately it can't be long before i receive my appointment brock well you see such things are often apt to hang fire for a time tesman have you heard anything definite eh brock nothing exactly definite interrupting himself but by the by i have one piece of news for you tesman well brock your old friend eilert lovborg has returned to town tesman oh i know that already brock indeed how did you learn it tesman from that lady who went out with hedda brock really what was her name i didn't quite catch it tesman mrs elfsted brock aha sheriff elfsted's wife of course he has been living up in their regions tesman and fancy i'm delighted to hear that he is quite a reformed character brock so they say tesman and then he has published a new book eh brock yes indeed he has tesman and i hear it has made some sensation brock quite an unusual sensation tesman fancy isn't that good news a man of such extraordinary talents i felt so grieved to think that he had gone irretrievably to ruin brock that was what everybody thought tesman but i cannot imagine what he will take to now how in the world will he be able to make his living eh during the last words hedda has entered by the hall door hedda to brock laughing with a touch of scorn tesman is for ever worrying about how people are to make their living tesman well you see dear we were talking about poor eilert lufborg hedda glancing at him rapidly oh indeed seats herself in the armchair beside the stove and asks indifferently what is the matter with him tesman well no doubt he has run through all his property long ago and he can scarcely write a new book every year eh so i really can't see what is to become of him brock perhaps i can give you some information on that point tesman indeed brock you must remember that his relations have a good deal of influence tesman oh his relations unfortunately have entirely washed their hands of him brock at one time they called him the hope of the family tesman at one time yes but he has put an end to all that hedda 
who knows with a slight smile i hear they have reclaimed him up at sheriff elfstead's brock and then this book that he has published tesman well well i hope to goodness they may find something for him to do i have just written to him i asked him to come and see us this evening hedda dear brock but my dear fellow you are booked for my bachelor's party this evening you promised on the pier last night hedda had you forgotten tesman tesman yes i had utterly forgotten brock but it doesn't matter for you may be sure that he won't come tesman what makes you think that eh brock with a little hesitation rising and resting his hands on the back of his chair my dear tesman and you too mrs tesman i think i ought not to keep you in the dark about something that that tesman that concerns eilert brock both you and him tesman well my dear judge out with it brock you must be prepared to find your appointment deferred longer than you desired or expected tesman jumping up uneasily is there some hitch about it eh brock the nomination may perhaps be made conditional on the result of a competition tesman competition think of that hedda hedda leans further back in the chair aha aha tesman but who can my competitor be surely not brock yes precisely eilert Luvborg. tesman clasping his hands no no it's quite inconceivable quite impossible eh brock hm that is what it may come to all the same tesman well but judge brock it would show the most incredible lack of consideration for me gesticulates with his arms for just think i'm a married man we have married on the strength of these prospects hedda and i and run deep into debt and borrowed money from aunt yulia too good heavens they had as good as promised me the appointment eh brock well 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 no doubt you will get it in the end only after a contest hedda immovable in her armchair fancy tesman there will be a sort of sporting interest in that tesman why my dearest hedda how can you be so indifferent about it hedda as before i am not at all indifferent i am most eager to see who wins brock in any case mrs tesman it is best that you should know how matters stand i mean before you set about the little purchases i hear you are threatening hedda this can make no difference brock indeed then i have no more to say good-bye to tesman i shall look in on my way back from my afternoon walk and take you home with me tesman oh yes yes your news has quite upset me hedda reclining holds out her hand good-bye judge and be sure you call in the afternoon brock many thanks good-bye good-bye tesman accompanying him to the door good-bye my dear judge you must really excuse me judge brock goes out by the hall door tesman crosses the room oh hedda one should never rush into adventures eh hedda looks at him smiling do you do that tesman yes dear there is no denying it was adventurous to go and marry and set up house upon mere expectations hedda perhaps you are right there tesman well at all events we have our delightful home hedda fancy the home we both dreamed of the home we were in love with i may almost say eh hedda rising slowly and wearily it was part of our compact that we were to go into society to keep open house tesman yes if you only knew how i have been looking forward to it fancy to see you as hostess in a select circle eh well 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 for the present we shall have to get on without society hedda only to invite aunt yulia now and then oh i had intended you to lead such an utterly different life dear hedda of course i cannot have my man in livery just yet tesman oh no unfortunately it would be out of the question for us to keep a footman you know hedda and the saddle horse i was to have had tesman aghast the saddle horse hedda i suppose i must not think of that now tesman good heavens no that's as clear as daylight 
hedda goes up the room well i shall have one thing at least to kill time with in the meanwhile tesman beaming oh thank heaven for that what is it hedda eh hedda in the middle doorway looks at him with covert scorn my pistols george tesman in alarm your pistols hedda with cold eyes general gobbler's pistols she goes out through the inner room to the left tesman rushes up to the middle doorway and calls after her no for heaven's sake hedda darling don't touch those dangerous things for my sake hedda eh end of act one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act Two of Hedda Gobbler by Henrik Ibsen, translated by Edmund Gosse, eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight, and William Archer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Two. The room at the Tesmans, as in the first act, except that the piano has been removed, and an elegant little writing table with bookshelves put in its place a smaller table stands near the sofa on the left most of the bouquets have been taken away mrs elvsted's bouquet is upon the large table in front it is afternoon hedda dressed to receive callers is alone in the room she stands by the open glass door loading a revolver the fellow to it lies in an open pistol case on the writing table hedda looks down the garden and calls so you are here again judge brock is heard calling from a distance as you see mrs tesman hedda raises the pistol and points now i'll shoot you judge brock brock calling unseen no 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 don't stand aiming at me hedda this is what comes of sneaking in by the back way note back wehe means both back ways and underhand courses End note. she fires brock nearer are you out of your senses hedda dear me did i happen to hit you brock still outside i wish you would let these pranks alone hedda come in then judge judge brock dressed as though for a men's party enters by the glass door he carries a light overcoat over his arm brock what the deuce haven't you tired of that sport yet what are you shooting at hedda oh i am only firing in the air brock gently takes the pistol out of her hand allow me madam looks at it ah i know this pistol well looks around where is the case ah here it is lays the pistol in it and shuts it now we won't play at that game any more to-day hedda then what in heaven's name would you have me do with myself brock have you had no visitors hedda closing the glass door not one i suppose all our set are still out of town brock and is tesman not at home either hedda at the writing-table putting the pistol-case in a drawer which she shuts no he rushed off to his aunt's directly after lunch he didn't expect you so early brock hm how stupid of me not to have thought of that hedda turning her head to look at him why stupid brock because if i had thought of it i should have come a little earlier hedda crossing the room then you would have found no one to receive you for i have been in my room changing my dress ever since lunch brock and is there no sort of little chink that we could hold a parley through hedda you have forgotten to arrange one brock that was another piece of stupidity hedda well we must just settle down here and wait tesman is not likely to be back for some time yet brock never mind i shall not be impatient hedda seats herself in the corner of the sofa brock lays his overcoat over the back of the nearest chair and sits down but keeps his hat in his hand a short silence they look at each other hedda well brock in the same tone well hedda i spoke first brock bending a little forward come let us have a cosy little chat mrs hedda note as this form of address is contrary to english usage 
and as the note of familiarity would be lacking in mrs tesman brock may in stage representation say miss hedda thus ignoring her marriage and reverting to the form of address no doubt customary between them of old End note. hedda leaning further back in the sofa does it not seem like a whole eternity since our last talk of course i don't count those few words yesterday evening and this morning brock you mean since our last confidential talk our last tete-a-tete -tete. hedda well yes since you put it so brock not a day has passed but i have wished that you were home again hedda and i have done nothing but wish the same thing brock you really mrs hedda and i thought you had been enjoying your tour so much hedda oh yes you may be sure of that brock but tesman's letters spoke of nothing but happiness hedda oh tesman you see he thinks nothing so delightful as grubbing in libraries and making copies of old parchments or whatever you call them brock with a spice of malice well that is his vocation in life or part of it at any rate hedda yes of course and no doubt when it's your vocation but i oh my dear mr brock how mortally bored i have been brock sympathetically do you really say so in downright earnest hedda yes you can surely understand it to go for six whole months without meeting a soul that knew anything of our circle or could talk about the things we are interested in brock yes yes i too should feel that a deprivation hedda and then what i found most intolerable of all brock well hedda was being everlastingly in the company of one in the same person brock with a nod of assent morning noon and night yes at all possible times and seasons hedda i said everlastingly brock just so but i should have thought with our excellent tesman one could hedda tesman is a, a specialist my dear judge brock undeniably hedda and specialists are not at all amusing to travel with not in the long run at any rate brock not even the specialist one happens to love hedda foul don't use that sickening word brock taken aback what do you say mrs hedda hedda half laughing half irritated you should just try it to hear of nothing but the history of civilization morning noon and night brock everlastingly hedda yes 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 and then all this about the domestic industry of the middle ages that's the most disgusting part of it brock looks searchingly at her but tell me in that case how am i to understand your <clears throat> hedda my accepting george tesman you mean brock well let us put it so hedda good heavens do you see anything so wonderful in that brock yes and no mrs hedda hedda i had positively danced myself tired my dear judge my day was done with a slight shudder oh no i won't say that nor think it either brock you have assuredly no reason to hedda oh reasons watching him closely and george tesman after all you must admit that he is correctness itself brock his correctness and respectability are beyond all question hedda and i don't see anything absolutely ridiculous about him do you brock ridiculous no i shouldn't exactly say so hedda well and his powers of research at all events are untiring i see no reason why he should not one day come to the front after all brock looks at her hesitatingly i thought that you like every one else expected him to attain the highest distinction hedda with an expression of fatigue well yes so i did and then since he was bent at all hazards on being allowed to provide for me i really don't know why i should not have accepted his offer brock no if you look at it in that light hedda it was more than my other adorers were prepared to do for me my dear judge brock laughing well i can't answer for all the rest but as for myself you know quite well that i have always entertained a, a certain respect for the marriage tie for marriage as an institution mrs hedda hedda jestingly oh 
i assure you i have never cherished any hopes with respect to you brock all i require is a pleasant and intimate interior where i can make myself useful in every way and am free to come and go as a, as a trusted friend hedda of the master of the house do you mean brock bowing frankly of the mistress first of all but of course of the master too in the second place such a triangular friendship if i may call it so is really a great convenience for all parties let me tell you hedda yes i have many a time longed for some one to make a third on our travels oh those railway carriage tete-a-tetes brock fortunately your wedding journey is over now hedda shaking her head not by a long long way i have only arrived at a station on the line brock well then the passengers jump out and move about a little mrs hedda hedda i never jump out brock really hedda no because there is always someone standing by to brock laughing to look at your ankles do you mean hedda precisely brock well but dear me hedda with a gesture of repulsion i won't have it i would rather keep my seat where i happen to be and continue the tete-a-tete brock but suppose a third person were to jump in and join the couple hedda oh ah that is quite another matter brock a trusted sympathetic friend hedda with a fund of conversation on all sorts of lively topics brock and not the least bit of a specialist hedda with an audible sigh yes that would be a relief indeed brock hears the front door open and glances in that direction the triangle is completed hedda half aloud and on goes the train george tesman in a grey walking suit with a soft felt hat enters from the hall he has a number of unbound books under his arm and in his pockets tesman goes up to the table beside the corner settee Oof, what a load for a warm day all these books lays them on the table i'm positively perspiring hedda hello are you there already my dear judge eh berta didn't tell me brock rising i came in through the garden hedda what books have you got there tesman stands looking them through some new books on my special subjects quite indispensable to me hedda your special subjects brock yes books on his special subjects mrs tesman brock and hedda exchange a confidential smile hedda do you need still more books on your special subjects tesman yes my dear hedda one can never have too many of them of course one must keep up with all that is written and published hedda oh yes i suppose one must tesman searching among his books and look here i've got hold of eilert lovborg's new book too offering it to her perhaps you would like to glance through it hedda eh hedda no thank you or uh, rather afterwards perhaps tesman i looked into it a little on the way home brock well what do you think of it as a specialist tesman i think it shows quite remarkable soundness of judgment he never wrote like that before putting the books together now i shall take all these into my study i'm longing to cut the leaves and then i must change my clothes to brock i suppose we needn't start just yet eh brock oh dear no there is not the slightest hurry tesman well then i will take my time is going with his books but stops in the doorway and turns by the by hedda aunt yulia is not coming this evening hedda not coming is it that affair of the bonnet that keeps her away tesman oh not at all how could you think such a thing of aunt yulia just fancy the fact is aunt rina is very ill hedda she always is tesman yes but to-day she is much worse than usual poor dear hedda oh then it's only natural that her sister should remain with her i must bear my disappointment tesman and you can't imagine dear how delighted aunt yulia seemed to be because you had come home looking so flourishing hedda half aloud rising oh those everlasting aunts tesman what hedda going to the glass door nothing tesman oh all right he goes through the inner room out to the right 
brock what bonnet were you talking about hedda oh it was a little episode with miss tesman this morning she had laid down her bonnet on the chair there looks at him and smiles and i pretended to think it was the servants brock shaking his head now my dear mrs hedda how could you do such a thing to that excellent old lady too hedda nervously crossing the room well you see these impulses come over me all of a sudden and i cannot resist them throws herself down in the easy chair by the stove oh i don't know how to explain it brock behind the easy chair you are not really happy that is at the bottom of it hedda looking straight before her i know of no reason why i should be happy perhaps you can give me one brock well amongst other things because you have got exactly the home you had set your heart on hedda looks up at him and laughs do you too believe in that legend brock is there nothing in it then hedda oh yes there is something in it brock well hedda there is this in it that i made use of tesman to see me home from evening parties last summer brock i unfortunately had to go quite a different way hedda that's true i know you were going a different way last summer brock laughing oh fie mrs hedda well then you and tesman hedda well we happened to pass here one evening tesman poor fellow was writhing in the agony of having to find conversation so i took pity on the learned man brock smiles doubtfully you took pity <laughs> hedda yes i really did and so to help him out of his torment i happened to say in pure thoughtlessness that i should like to live in this villa brock no more than that hedda not that evening brock but afterwards hedda yes my thoughtlessness had consequences my dear judge brock unfortunately that too often happens mrs hedda hedda thanks so you see it was this enthusiasm for secretary Falk's villa that first constituted a bond of sympathy between george tesman and me from that came our engagement and our marriage and our wedding journey and all the rest of it well well my dear judge as you make your bed so you must lie i could almost say brock this is exquisite and you really cared not a rap about it all the time hedda no heaven knows i didn't brock but now now that we have made it so homelike for you hedda uh the rooms all seem to smell of lavender and dried rose leaves but perhaps it's aunt yulia that has brought that scent with her brock laughing no i think it must be a legacy from the late mrs secretary falk hedda yes there is an odour of mortality about it it reminds me of a bouquet the day after the ball clasps her hands behind her head leans back in her chair and looks at him oh my dear judge you cannot imagine how horribly i shall bore myself here brock why should not you too find some sort of vocation in life mrs hedda hedda a vocation that should attract me brock if possible of course hedda heaven knows what sort of a vocation that could be i often wonder whether breaking off but that would never do either brock who can tell let me hear what it is hedda whether i might not get tesman to go into politics i mean brock laughing tesman no really now political life is not the thing for him not at all in his line hedda no i dare say not but if i could get him into it all the same brock why what satisfaction could you find in that if he is not fitted for that sort of thing why should you want to drive him into it hedda because i am bored i tell you after a pause so you think it quite out of the question that tesman should ever get into the ministry brock hm you see my dear mrs hedda to get into the ministry he would have to be a tolerably rich man hedda rising impatiently yes there we have it it is this genteel poverty i have managed to drop into crosses the room that is what makes life so pitiable so utterly ludicrous for that's what it is brock now i should say the fault lay elsewhere 
hedda where then brock you have never gone through any really stimulating experience hedda anything serious you mean brock yes you may call it so but now you may perhaps have one in store hedda tossing her head oh you're thinking of the annoyances about this wretched professorship but that must be tesman's own affair i assure you i shall not waste a thought upon it brock no no i dare say not but suppose now that what people call in elegant language a solemn responsibility were to come upon you smiling a, a new responsibility mrs hedda hedda angrily be quiet nothing of that sort will ever happen brock warily we will speak of this again a year hence at the very outside hedda curtly i have no turn for anything of the sort judge brock no responsibilities for me brock are you so unlike the generality of women as to have no turn for duties which hedda beside the glass door oh do be quiet i tell you i often think there is only one thing in the world i have any turn for brock drawing near to her and what is that if i may ask hedda stands looking out boring myself to death now you know it turns looks towards the inner room and laughs yes as i thought here comes the professor brock softly in a tone of warning come 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 mrs hedda george tesman dressed for the party with his gloves and hat in his hand enters from the right through the inner room tesman hedda has no message come from eilert lovborg eh hedda no tesman then you'll see he'll be here presently brock do you really think he will come tesman yes i am almost sure of it for what you were telling us this morning must have been a mere floating rumour brock you think so tesman at any rate aunt yulia said she did not believe for a moment that he would ever stand in my way again fancy that brock well then that's all right tesman placing his hat and gloves on a chair on the right yes but you must really let me wait for him as long as possible brock we have plenty of time yet none of my guests will arrive before seven or half past tesman then meanwhile we can keep hedda company and see what happens eh hedda placing brock's hat and overcoat upon the corner settee and at the worst mr lovborg can remain here with me brock offering to take his things oh allow me mrs tesman what do you mean by at the worst hedda if he won't go with you and tesman tesman looks dubiously at her but hedda dear do you think it would quite do for him to remain with you eh remember aunt yulia can't come hedda no but mrs elvsted is coming we three can have a cup of tea together tesman oh yes that will be all right brock smiling and that would perhaps be the safest plan for him hedda why so brock well you know mrs tesman how you used to gird at my little bachelor parties you declared they were adapted only for men of the strictest principles hedda but no doubt mr lovborg's principles are strict enough now a converted sinner berta appears at the hall door berta there's a gentleman asking if you are at home ma'am hedda well show him in tesman softly i'm sure it is he fancy that eilert lovborg enters from the hall he is slim and lean of the same age as tesman but looks older and somewhat worn out his hair and beard are of a blackish brown his face long and pale but with patches of colour on the cheekbones he is dressed in a well-cut black visiting suit quite new he has dark gloves and a silk hat he stops near the door and makes a rapid bow seeming somewhat embarrassed tesman goes up to him and shakes him warmly by the hand well my dear eilert so at last we meet again eilert lovborg speaks in a subdued voice thanks for your letter tesman approaching hedda will you too shake hands with me mrs tesman hedda taking his hand i am glad to see you mr lovborg with a motion of her hand i don't know whether you two gentlemen lovborg bowing slightly judge brock i think brock doing likewise oh yes in the old days 
tesman to lovborg with his hands on his shoulders and now you must make yourself entirely at home eilert mustn't he hedda for i hear you are going to settle in town again eh lovborg yes i am tesman quite right quite right let me tell you i have got hold of your new book but i haven't had time to read it yet lovborg you may spare yourself the trouble tesman why so lovborg because there is very little in it tesman oh, just fancy how can you say so brock but it has been very much praised i hear lovborg that was what i wanted so i put nothing into the book but what every one would agree with brock very wise of you tesman well but my dear eilert lovborg for now i mean to win myself a position again to make a fresh start tesman a little embarrassed ah that is what you wish to do eh lovborg smiling lays down his hat and draws a packet wrapped in paper from his coat pocket but when this one appears george tesman you will have to read it for this is the real book the book i have put my true self into tesman indeed and what is it lovborg it is the continuation tesman the continuation of what lovborg of the book tesman of the new book lovborg of course tesman why my dear eilert does it not come down to our own days lovborg yes it does and this one deals with the future tesman with the future but good heavens we know nothing of the future lovborg no but there is a thing or two to be said about it all the same opens the packet look here tesman why that's not your handwriting lovborg i dictated it turning over the pages it falls into two sections the first deals with the civilizing forces of the future and here is the second running through the pages towards the end forecasting the probable line of development tesman how odd now i should never have thought of writing anything of that sort hedda at the glass door drumming on the pane hm, i dare say not lovborg replacing the manuscript in its paper and laying the packet on the table i brought it thinking i might read you a little of it this evening tesman well that was very good of you eilert but this evening looking at brock i don't quite see how we can manage it lovborg well then some other time there is no hurry brock i must tell you mr lovborg there is a little gathering at my house this evening mainly in honour of tesman you know lovborg looking for his hat oh well then i won't detain you brock no but listen will you not do me the favour of joining us lovborg curtly and decidedly no i can't thank you very much brock oh nonsense do we shall be quite a select little circle and i assure you we shall have a lively time as mrs head uh, as mrs tesman says lovborg oh, i have no doubt of it but nevertheless brock and then you might bring your manuscript with you and read it to tesman at my house i could give you a room to yourselves tesman yes think of that eilert why shouldn't you eh hedda interposing but tesman if mr lovborg would really rather not i am sure mr lovborg is much more inclined to remain here and have supper with me lovborg looking at her with you mrs tesman hedda and with mrs elvsted lovborg ah lightly i saw her for a moment this morning hedda did you well she is coming this evening so you see you are almost bound to remain mr lovborg or she will have no one to see her home lovborg well, that's true many thanks mrs tesman in that case i will remain hedda then i have one or two orders to give the servant she goes to the hall door and rings berta enters hedda talks to her in a whisper and points towards the inner room berta nods and goes out again tesman at the same time to lovborg tell me eilert is it this new subject the future that you are going to lecture about lovborg yes tesman they told me at the booksellers that you are going to deliver a course of lectures this autumn lovborg that is my intention i hope you won't take it ill tesman tesman oh no not in the least but lovborg 
i can quite understand that it must be disagreeable to you tesman cast down oh i can't expect you out of consideration for me to lovborg but i shall wait till you have received your appointment tesman will you wait yes but yes but are you not going to compete with me eh lovborg no it is only the moral victory i care for tesman why bless me then aunt yulia was right after all oh yes i knew it hedda just fancy eilert lovborg is not going to stand in our way hedda curtly our way pray leave me out of the question she goes up towards the inner room where berta is placing a tray with decanters and glasses on the table hedda nods approval and comes forward again berta goes out tesman at the same time and you judge brock what do you say to this eh brock well i say that a moral victory hm, may be all very fine tesman yes certainly but all the same hedda looking at tesman with a cold smile you stand there looking as if you were thunderstruck tesman well yes so i am i almost think brock don't you see mrs tesman a thunderstorm has just passed over hedda pointing towards the inner room will you not take a glass of cold punch gentlemen brock looking at his watch a stirrup cup yes it wouldn't come amiss tesman a capital idea hedda just the thing now that the weight has been taken off my mind hedda will you not join them mr lovborg lovborg with a gesture of refusal no thank you nothing for me brock why bless me cold punch is surely not poison lovborg perhaps not for every one hedda i will keep mr lovborg company in the meantime tesman yes yes hedda dear do he and brock go into the inner room seat themselves drink punch smoke cigarettes and carry on a lively conversation during what follows eilert lovborg remains standing beside the stove hedda goes to the writing-table hedda raising her voice a little do you care to look at some photographs mr lovborg you know tesman and i made a tour in the tyrol on our way home she takes up an album and places it on the table beside the sofa in the further corner of which she seats herself eilert lovborg approaches stops and looks at her then he takes a chair and seats himself to her left with his back towards the inner room hedda opening the album do you see this range of mountains mr lovborg it's the ortler group tesman has written the name underneath here it is the ortler group near meran lovborg who has never taken his eyes off her says softly and slowly hedda gobbler hedda glancing hastily at him ah hush lovborg repeats softly hedda gobbler hedda looking at the album that was my name in the old days when we two knew each other lovborg and i must teach myself never to say hedda gobbler again never as long as i live hedda still turning over the pages yes you must and i think you ought to practice in time the sooner the better i should say lovborg in a tone of indignation hedda gobbler married and married to george tesman hedda yes so the world goes lovborg oh hedda hedda how could you throw yourself away hedda looked sharply at him what i can't allow this lovborg what do you mean tesman comes into the room and goes towards the sofa hedda hears him coming and says in an indifferent tone and this is a view from the val d'ampezzo mr lovborg just look at these peaks looks affectionately up at tesman what's the name of these curious peaks dear tesman let me see oh those are the dolomites hedda yes that's it those are the dolomites mr lovborg tesman hedda dear i only wanted to ask whether i shouldn't bring you a little punch after all for yourself at any rate eh hedda yes do please and perhaps a few biscuits tesman no cigarettes hedda no tesman very well he goes into the inner room and out to the right brock sits in the inner room and keeps an eye from time to time on hedda and lovborg lovborg softly as before 
answer me hedda how could you go and do this hedda apparently absorbed in the album if you continue to say do to me i won't talk to you Lutborg. may i not say do even when we are alone hedda no you may think it but you mustn't say it Lutborg. ah i understand it is an offence against george tesman whom you love hedda glances at him and smiles love what an idea Lutborg. you don't love him then hedda but i won't hear of any sort of unfaithfulness remember that Lutborg. hedda answer me one thing hedda hush tesman enters with a small tray from the inner room tesman here you are isn't this tempting he puts the tray on the table hedda why do you bring it yourself tesman filling the glasses because i think it's such fun to wait upon you hedda hedda but you have poured out two glasses mr lubborg said he wouldn't have any tesman no but mrs elvsted will be here soon won't she hedda yes by the by mrs elvsted tesman had you forgotten her eh hedda we were so absorbed in these photographs shows him a picture do you remember this little village tesman oh it's that one just below the brenner pass it was there we passed the night hedda and met that lively party of tourists tesman yes that was the place fancy if we could only have had you with us eilert eh he returns to the inner room and sits beside brock Lufborg. answer me this one thing hedda hedda well Lufborg. was there no love in your friendship for me either not a spark not a tinge of love in it hedda i wonder if there was to me it seems as though we were two good comrades two thoroughly intimate friends smilingly you especially were frankness itself Lufborg. it was you that made me so hedda as i look back upon it all i think there was really something beautiful something fascinating something daring in in that secret intimacy that comradeship which no living creature so much as dreamed of Lufborg. yes yes hedda was there not when i used to come to your father's in the afternoon and the general sat over at the window reading his papers with his back towards us hedda and we too on the corner sofa Lufborg. always with the same illustrated paper before us hedda for want of an album yes Lufborg. yes hedda and when i made my confessions to you told you about myself things that at that time no one else knew there i would sit and tell you of my escapades my days and nights of devilment oh hedda what was the power in you that forced me to confess these things hedda do you think it was any power in me Lufborg. how else can i explain it and all those those roundabout questions you used to put to me hedda which you understood so particularly well Lufborg. how could you sit and question me like that question me quite frankly hedda in roundabout terms please observe Lufborg. yes but frankly nevertheless cross-question me about all that sort of thing hedda and how could you answer mr Lufborg? Lufborg. yes that is just what i can't understand in looking back upon it but tell me now hedda was there not love at the bottom of our friendship on your side did you not feel as though you might purge my stains away if i made you my confessor was it not so hedda no not quite Lufborg. what was your motive then hedda do you think it quite incomprehensible that a young girl when it can be done without any one knowing Lufborg. well hedda should be glad to have a peep now and then into a world which Lufborg, which hedda which she is forbidden to know anything about Lufborg, so that was it hedda partly partly i almost think Lufborg, comradeship in the thirst for life but why should not that at any rate have continued hedda the fault was yours Lufborg, it was you that broke with me hedda yes 
when our friendship threatened to develop into something more serious shame upon you eilert lovborg how could you think of wronging your your frank comrade lovborg clenching his hands oh why did you not carry out your threat why did you not shoot me down hedda because i have such a dread of scandal lovborg yes hedda you are a coward at heart hedda a terrible coward changing her tone but it was a lucky thing for you and now you have found ample consolation at the elfsteads lovborg i know what thea has confided to you hedda and perhaps you have confided to her something about us lovborg not a word she is too stupid to understand anything of that sort hedda stupid lovborg she is stupid about matters of that sort hedda and i am cowardly bends over towards him without looking him in the face and says more softly but now i will confide something to you lovborg eagerly well hedda the fact that i dared not shoot you down lovborg yes hedda that was not my most errant cowardice that evening lovborg looks at her a moment understands and whispers passionately oh hedda hedda gobbler now i begin to see a hidden reason beneath our comradeship you and i after all then it was your craving for life hedda softly with a sharp glance take care believe nothing of the sort twilight has begun to fall the hall door is opened from without by berta hedda closes the album with a bang and calls smilingly ah at last my darling thea come along mrs elvsted enters from the hall she is in evening dress the door is closed behind her hedda on the sofa stretches out her arms towards her oh my sweet thea you can't think how i have been longing for you mrs elvsted in passing exchanges slight salutations with the gentleman in the inner room then goes up to the table and gives hedda her hand eilert lovborg has risen he and mrs elvsted greet each other with a silent nod mrs elvsted ought i to go in and talk to your husband for a moment hedda oh not at all leave those two alone they will soon be going mrs elvsted are they going out hedda yes to a supper party mrs elvsted quickly to lovborg not you lovborg no hedda mr lovborg remains with us mrs elvsted takes a chair and is about to seat herself at his side oh how nice it is here hedda no thank you my little thea not there you'll be good enough to come over here to me i will sit between you mrs elvsted yes just as you please she goes round the table and seats herself on the sofa at hedda's right lovborg reseats himself on his chair lovborg after a short pause to hedda is not she lovely to look at hedda lightly stroking her hair only to look at lovborg yes for we two she and i we are two real comrades we have absolute faith in each other so we can sit and talk with perfect frankness hedda not round about mr lovborg lovborg well mrs elvsted softly clinging close to hedda oh how happy i am hedda for only think he says i have inspired him too hedda looks at her with a smile ah does he say that dear lovborg and then she is so brave mrs tesman mrs elvsted good heavens am i brave lovborg exceedingly where your comrade is concerned hedda ah yes courage if one only had that lovborg what then what do you mean hedda then life would perhaps be livable after all with a sudden change of tone but now my dearest thea you really must have a glass of cold punch mrs elvsted no thanks i never take anything of that kind hedda well then you mr lovborg lovborg nor i thank you mrs elvsted no he doesn't either hedda looks fixedly at him but if i say you shall lovborg it would be no use hedda laughing then i poor creature have no sort of power over you lovborg not in that respect hedda but seriously i think you ought to for your own sake 
mrs elvsted why hedda lovborg how so hedda or rather on account of other people lovborg indeed hedda otherwise people might be apt to suspect that in your heart of hearts you did not feel quite secure quite confident in yourself mrs elvsted softly oh please hedda lovborg people may suspect what they like for the present mrs elvsted joyfully yes let them hedda i saw it plainly in judge brock's face a moment ago lovborg what did you see hedda his contemptuous smile when you dared not go with them into the inner room lovborg dared not of course i preferred to stop here and talk to you mrs elvsted what could be more natural hedda hedda but the judge could not guess that and i saw too the way he smiled and glanced at tesman when you dared not accept his invitation to this wretched little supper party of his lovborg dared not do you say i dared not hedda i don't say so but that was how judge brock understood it lovborg well let him hedda then you are not going with them lovborg i will stay with i will stay here with you and thea mrs elvsted yes hedda how can you doubt that hedda smiles and nods approvingly to lovborg firm as a rock faithful to your principles now and for ever ah oh, that is how a man should be turns to mrs elvsted and caresses her well now what did i tell you when you came to us this morning in such a state of distraction lovborg surprised distraction mrs elvsted terrified hedda oh hedda hedda you can see for yourself you haven't the slightest reason to be in such mortal terror interrupting herself there now we can all three enjoy ourselves lovborg who has given a start ah what is all this mrs tesman mrs elvsted oh my god hedda what are you saying what are you doing hedda don't get excited that horrid judge brock is sitting watching you lovborg so she was in mortal terror on my account mrs elvsted softly and piteously oh hedda now you have ruined everything lovborg looks fixedly at her for a moment his face is distorted so that was my comrade's frank confidence in me mrs elvsted imploringly oh my dearest friend only let me tell you lovborg takes one of the glasses of punch raises it to his lips and says in a low husky voice your health thea he empties the glass puts it down and takes the second mrs elvsted softly oh hedda hedda how could you do this hedda i do it i are you crazy lovborg here's to your health too mrs tesman thanks for the truth hurrah for the truth he empties the glass and is about to refill it hedda lays her hand on his arm come come no more for the present remember you are going out to supper mrs elvsted no 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 hedda hush they're sitting watching you lovborg putting down the glass now thea tell me the truth mrs elvsted yes lovborg did your husband know that you would come after me mrs elvsted wringing her hands oh hedda do you hear what he is asking lovborg was it arranged between you and him that you were to come to town and look after me perhaps it was the sheriff himself that urged you to come aha my dear no doubt he wanted my help in his office or was it at the card-table that he missed me mrs elvsted softly in agony oh lovborg 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 seizes a glass and is on the point of filling it here's a glass for the old sheriff too hedda preventing him no more just now remember you have to read your manuscript to tesman lovborg calmly putting down the glass it was stupid of me all this thea to take it in this way i mean don't be angry with me my dear dear comrade you shall see both you and the others that if i was fallen once now i have risen again thanks to you thea mrs elvsted radiant with joy oh heaven be praised 
brock has in the meantime looked at his watch he and tesman rise and come into the drawing-room brock takes his hat and overcoat well mrs tesman our time has come hedda i suppose it has lovborg rising mine too judge brock mrs elvsted softly and imploringly oh lovborg don't do it hedda pinching her arm they can hear you mrs elvsted with a suppressed shriek ow lovborg to brock you were good enough to invite me brock well are you coming after all lovborg yes many thanks brock i'm delighted lovborg to tesman putting the parcel of manuscript in his pocket i should like to show you one or two things before i send it to the printers tesman fancy that will be delightful but hedda dear how is mrs elvsted to get home eh hedda oh that can be managed somehow lovborg looking towards the ladies mrs elvsted of course i'll come again and fetch her approaching at ten or thereabouts mrs tesman will that do hedda certainly that will do capitally tesman well then that's all right but you must not expect me so early hedda hedda oh you may stop as long as long as ever you please mrs elvsted trying to conceal her anxiety well then mr lovborg i shall remain here until you come lovborg with his hat in his hand pray do mrs elvsted brock and now off goes the excursion train gentlemen i hope we shall have a lively time as a certain fair lady puts it hedda oh, if only the fair lady could be present unseen brock why unseen hedda in order to hear a little of your liveliness at first hand judge brock brock laughing i should not advise the fair lady to try it tesman also laughing come you're a nice one hedda fancy that brock well good-bye good-bye ladies lovborg bowing about ten o'clock then brock lovborg and tesman go out by the hall door at the same time berta enters from the inner room with a lighted lamp which she places on the drawing-room table she goes out by the way she came mrs elvsted who has risen and is wandering restlessly about the room hedda hedda what will come of all this hedda at ten o'clock he will be here i can see him already with vine leaves in his hair flushed and fearless mrs elvsted oh i hope he may hedda and then you see then he will have regained control over himself then he will be a free man for all his days mrs elvsted oh god if he would only come as you see him now hedda he will come as i see him so and not otherwise rises and approaches thea you may doubt him as long as you please i believe in him and now we will try mrs elvsted you have some hidden motive in this hedda hedda yes i have i want for once in my life to have power to mould a human destiny mrs elvsted have you not the power hedda i have not and have never had it mrs elvsted not your husband's hedda do you think that is worth the trouble oh if you could only understand how poor i am and fate has made you so rich clasped her passionately in her arms i think i must burn your hair off after all mrs elvsted let me go let me go i am afraid of you hedda berta in the middle doorway tea is laid in the dining-room ma'am hedda very well we are coming mrs elvsted no 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 i would rather go home alone at once hedda nonsense first you shall have a cup of tea you little stupid and then at ten o'clock eilert lovborg will be here with vine leaves in his hair she drags mrs elvsted almost by force towards the middle doorway end of act two Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Three of Hedda Gobbler by Henrik Ibsen. Translated by Edmund Gossie, eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight, and William Archer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Three. The room at the Tesmans. The curtains are drawn over the middle doorway and also over the glass door. The lamp, half turned down and with a shade over it, is burning on the table. In the stove, the door of which stands open, there has been a fire which is now nearly burnt out. Mrs. Elvsted, wrapped in a large shawl and with her feet upon a footrest, sits close to the stove sunk back in the armchair hedda fully dressed lies sleeping upon the sofa with a sofa blanket over her mrs elvsted after a pause suddenly sits up in her chair and listens eagerly then she sinks back again wearily moaning to herself not yet oh god oh god not yet berta slips cautiously in by the hall door she has a letter in her hand mrs elvsted turns and whispers eagerly well has any one come berta softly yes a girl has just brought this letter mrs elvsted quickly holding out her hand a letter give it to me berta no it's for dr tesman ma'am mrs elvsted oh indeed berta it was miss tesman's servant that brought it i'll lay it here on the table mrs elvsted yes do berta laying down the letter i think i had better put out the lamp it's smoking mrs elvsted yes put it out it must soon be daylight now berta putting out the lamp it is daylight already ma'am mrs elvsted yes broad day and no one come back yet berta lord bless you ma'am i guessed how it would be mrs elvsted you guessed berta yes when i saw that a certain person had come back to town and that he went off with them for we've heard enough about that gentleman before now mrs elvsted don't speak so loud you will waken mrs tesman berta looks towards the sofa and sighs no no let her sleep poor thing shan't i put some wood on the fire mrs elvsted thanks not for me berta oh very well she goes softly out by the hall door hedda is wakened by the shutting of the door and looks up what's that mrs elvsted it was only the servant hedda looking about her oh we're here yes now i remember sits erect upon the sofa stretches herself and rubs her eyes what o'clock is it thea mrs elvsted looks at her watch it's past seven hedda when did tesman come home mrs elvsted he has not come hedda not come home yet mrs elvsted rising no one has come hedda think of our watching and waiting here till four in the morning mrs elvsted wringing her hands and how i watched and waited for him hedda yawns and says with her hand before her mouth well well we might have spared ourselves the trouble mrs elvsted did you get a little sleep hedda oh yes i believe i have slept pretty well have you not mrs elvsted not for a moment i couldn't hedda not to save my life hedda rises and goes towards her there 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 there's nothing to be so alarmed about i understand quite well what has happened mrs elvsted well what do you think won't you tell me hedda why of course it has been a very late affair at judge brock's mrs elvsted yes yes that is clear enough but all the same hedda and then you see tesman hasn't cared to come home and ring us up in the middle of the night laughing perhaps he wasn't inclined to show himself either immediately after a jollification mrs elvsted but in that case where can he have gone hedda of course he has gone to his aunt's and slept there they have his old room ready for him mrs elvsted no he can't be with them for a letter has just come for him from miss tesman there it lies hedda indeed looks at the address why yes it's addressed in aunt yulia's own hand well then he has remained at judge brock's and as for eilert lovborg he is sitting with vine leaves in his hair reading his manuscript mrs elvsted oh hedda you were just saying things you don't believe a bit hedda you really are a little blockhead thea mrs elvsted oh yes i suppose i am hedda and how mortally tired you look mrs elvsted yes 
i am mortally tired hedda well then you must do as i tell you you must go into my room and lie down for a little while mrs elvsted oh no no i shouldn't be able to sleep hedda i am sure you would mrs elvsted well but your husband is certain to come soon now and then i want to know at once hedda i shall take care to let you know when he comes mrs elvsted do you promise me hedda hedda yes rely upon me just you go in and have a sleep in the meantime mrs elvsted thanks then i'll try to she goes off through the inner room hedda goes up to the glass door and draws back the curtains the broad daylight streams into the room then she takes a little hand glass from the writing table looks at herself in it and arranges her hair next she goes to the hall door and presses the bell button berta presently appears at the hall door berta did you want anything ma'am hedda yes you must put some more wood in the stove i am shivering berta bless me i'll make up the fire at once she rakes the embers together and lays a piece of wood upon them then stops and listens that was a ring at the front door ma'am hedda then go to the door i will look after the fire berta it'll soon burn up she goes out by the hall door hedda kneels on the footrest and lays some more pieces of wood in the stove after a short pause george tesman enters from the hall he looks tired and rather serious he steals on tiptoe towards the middle doorway and is about to slip through the curtains hedda at the stove without looking up good morning tesman turns hedda approaching her good heavens are you up so early eh hedda yes i am up very early this morning tesman and i never doubted you were still sound asleep fancy that hedda hedda don't speak so loud mrs elvsted is resting in my room tesman has mrs elvsted been here all night hedda yes since no one came to fetch her tesman ah to be sure hedda closes the door of the stove and rises well did you enjoy yourselves at judge brock's tesman have you been anxious about me eh hedda no i should never think of being anxious but i asked if you had enjoyed yourself tesman oh yes for once in a way especially the beginning of the evening for then eilert read me part of his book we arrived more than an hour too early fancy that and brock had all sorts of arrangements to make so eilert read to me hedda seating herself by the table on the right well tell me then tesman sitting on a footstool near the stove oh hedda you can't conceive what a book that is going to be i believe it is one of the most remarkable things that have ever been written fancy that hedda yes yes i don't care about that tesman i must make a confession to you hedda when he had finished reading a horrid feeling came over me hedda a horrid feeling tesman i felt jealous of eilert for having had it in him to write such a book only think hedda hedda yes yes i am thinking tesman and then how pitiful to think that he with all his gifts should be irreclaimable after all hedda i suppose you mean that he has more courage than the rest tesman no not at all i mean that he is incapable of taking his pleasures in moderation hedda and what came of it all in the end tesman well to tell the truth i think it might best be described as an orgy hedda hedda had he vine leaves in his hair tesman vine leaves no i saw nothing of the sort but he made a long rambling speech in honour of the woman who had inspired him in his work that was the phrase he used hedda did he name her tesman no he didn't but i can't help thinking he meant mrs elvsted you may be sure he did hedda well where did you part from him tesman on the way to town we broke up the last of us at any rate all together and brock came with us to get a breath of fresh air and then you see we agreed to take eilert home for he had had far more than was good for him hedda i dare say tesman but now comes the strange part of it hedda or i should rather say the melancholy part of it 
i declare i am almost ashamed on eilert's account to tell you hedda oh go on tesman well as we were getting near town you see i happened to drop a little behind the others only for a minute or two fancy that hedda yes 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 but tesman and then as i hurried after them what do you think i found by the wayside eh hedda oh how should i know tesman you mustn't speak of it to a soul hedda do you hear promise me for eilert's sake draws a parcel wrapped in paper from his coat pocket fancy dear i found this hedda is not that the parcel he had with him yesterday tesman yes it is the whole of his precious irreplaceable manuscript and he had gone and lost it and knew nothing about it only fancy hedda so deplorably hedda but why did you not give him back the parcel at once tesman i didn't dare to in the state he was then in hedda did you not tell any of the others that you had found it tesman oh far from it you can surely understand that for eilert's sake i wouldn't do that hedda so no one knows that eilert lovborg's manuscript is in your possession tesman no and no one must know it hedda then what did you say to him afterwards tesman i didn't talk to him again at all for when we got in among the streets he and two or three of the others gave us the slip and disappeared fancy that hedda indeed they must have taken him home then tesman yes so it would appear and brock too left us hedda and what have you been doing with yourself since tesman well i and some of the others went home with one of the party a jolly fellow and took our morning coffee with him or perhaps i should rather call it our night coffee eh but now when i have rested a little and given eilert poor fellow time to have his sleep out i must take this back to him hedda holds out her hand for the packet no don't give it to him not in such a hurry i mean let me read it first tesman no my dearest hedda i mustn't i really mustn't hedda you must not tesman no for you can imagine what a state of despair he will be in when he wakens and misses the manuscript he has no copy of it you must know he told me so hedda looking searchingly at him can such a thing not be reproduced written over again tesman no i don't think that would be possible for the inspiration you see hedda yes yes i suppose it depends on that lightly but by the by here is a letter for you tesman fancy hedda handing it to him it came early this morning tesman it's from aunt yulia what can it be he lays the packet on the other footstool opens the letter runs his eye through it and jumps up oh hedda she says that poor aunt rena is dying hedda well we were prepared for that tesman and that if i want to see her again i must make haste i'll run into them at once hedda suppressing a smile will you run tesman oh my dearest hedda if you could only make up your mind to come with me just think hedda rises and says wearily repelling the idea no no don't ask me i will not look upon sickness and death i loathe all sorts of ugliness tesman well well then bustling around my hat my overcoat oh in the hall i do hope i mayn't come too late hedda eh hedda oh if you run berta appears at the hall door berta judge brock is at the door and wishes to know if he may come in tesman at this time no i can't possibly see him hedda but i can to berta ask judge brock to come in berta goes out hedda quickly whispering the parcel tesman she snatches it up from the stool tesman yes give it to me hedda no no i will keep it till you come back she goes to the writing-table and places it in the bookcase tesman stands in a flurry of haste and cannot get his gloves on judge brock enters from the hall hedda nodding to him you are an early bird i must say brock yes don't you think so to tesman are you on the move too tesman yes i must rush off to my aunt's fancy the invalid one is lying at death's door poor creature brock 
dear me is she indeed then on no account let me detain you at such a critical moment tesman yes i must really rush good-bye good-bye he hastens out by the hall door hedda approaching you seem to have made a particularly lively night of it at your rooms judge brock brock i assure you i have not had my clothes off mrs hedda hedda not you either brock no as you may see but what has tesman been telling you of the night's adventures hedda oh some tiresome story only that they went and had coffee somewhere or other brock i've heard about that coffee party already eilert lovborg was not with them i fancy hedda no they had taken him home before that brock tesman too hedda no but some of the others he said brock smiling george tesman is really an ingenuous creature mrs hedda hedda yes heaven knows he is then is there something behind all this brock yes perhaps there may be hedda well then sit down my dear judge and tell your story in comfort she seats herself to the left of the table brock sits near her at the long side of the table hedda now then brock i had special reasons for keeping track of my guests or rather of some of my guests last night hedda of eilert lovborg among the rest perhaps brock frankly yes hedda now you make me really curious brock do you know where he and one or two of the others finished the night mrs hedda hedda if it is not quite unmentionable tell me brock oh no it's not at all unmentionable well they put in an appearance at a particularly animated soiree hedda of the lively kind brock of the very liveliest hedda tell me more of this judge brock brock lovborg as well as the others had been invited in advance i knew all about it but he had declined the invitation for now as you know he has become a new man hedda up at the elfsteads yes but he went after all then brock well you see mrs hedda unhappily the spirit moved him at my rooms last evening hedda yes i hear he found inspiration brock pretty violent inspiration well i fancy that altered his purpose for we men-folk are unfortunately not always so firm in our principles as we ought to be hedda oh i am sure you are an exception judge brock but as to lovborg brock to make a long story short he landed at last in mademoiselle diana's rooms hedda mademoiselle diana's brock it was mademoiselle diana that was giving the soiree to a select circle of her admirers and her lady friends hedda is she a red-haired woman brock precisely hedda a sort of a singer brock oh yes in her leisure moments and moreover a mighty huntress of men mrs hedda you have no doubt heard of her eilert lovborg was one of her most enthusiastic protectors in the days of his glory hedda and how did all this end brock far from amicably it appears after a most tender meeting they seem to have come to blows hedda lovborg and she brock yes he accused her or her friends of having robbed him he declared that his pocket-book had disappeared and other things as well in short he seems to have made a furious disturbance hedda and what came of it all brock it came to a general scrimmage in which the ladies as well as the gentlemen took part fortunately the police at last appeared on the scene hedda the police too brock yes i fancy it will prove a costly frolic for eilert lovborg crazy being that he is hedda how so brock he seems to have made a violent resistance to have hit one of the constables on the head and torn the coat off his back so they had to march him off to the police station with the rest hedda how have you learnt all this brock from the police themselves hedda gazing straight before her so that is what happened then he had no vine leaves in his hair brock vine leaves mrs hedda hedda changing her tone but tell me now judge what is your real reason for tracking out eilert lovborg's movements so carefully brock in the first place 
it could not be entirely indifferent to me if it should appear in the police court that he came straight from my house hedda will the matter come into court then brock of course however i should scarcely have troubled so much about that but i thought that as a friend of the family it was my duty to supply you and tesman with a full account of his nocturnal exploits hedda why so judge brock brock why because i have a shrewd suspicion that he intends to use you as a sort of blind hedda oh how can you think such a thing brock good heavens mrs hedda we have eyes in our head mark my words this mrs elvsted will be in no hurry to leave town again hedda well even if there should be anything between them i suppose there are plenty of other places where they could meet brock not a single home henceforth as before every respectable house will be closed against eilert lutborg hedda and so ought mine to be you mean brock yes i confess it would be more than painful to me if this personage were to be made free of your house how superfluous how intrusive he would be if he were to force his way into hedda into the triangle brock precisely it would simply mean that i should find myself homeless hedda looks at him with a smile so you want to be the one cock in the basket that is your aim brock nods slowly and lowers his voice yes that is my aim and for that i will fight with every weapon i can command hedda her smile vanishing i see you are a dangerous person when it comes to the point brock do you think so hedda i am beginning to think so and i am exceedingly glad to think that you have no sort of hold over me brock laughing equivocally well well mrs hedda perhaps you are right there if i had who knows what i might be capable of hedda come come now judge brock that sounds almost like a threat brock rising oh not at all the triangle you know ought if possible to be spontaneously constructed hedda there i agree with you brock well now i have said all i had to say and i had better be getting back to town good-bye mrs hedda he goes towards the glass door hedda rising are you going through the garden brock yes it's a short cut for me hedda and then it is a back way too brock quite so i have no objection to back ways they may be piquant enough at times hedda when there is ball practice going on you mean brock in the doorway laughing to her oh people don't shoot their tame poultry i fancy hedda also laughing oh no when there is only one cock in the basket they exchange laughing nods of farewell he goes she closes the door behind him hedda who has become quite serious stands for a moment looking out presently she goes and peeps through the curtain over the middle doorway then she goes to the writing-table takes lovborg's packet out of the bookcase and is on the point of looking through its contents berta is heard speaking loudly in the hall hedda turns and listens then she hastily locks up the packet in the drawer and lays the key on the inkstand eilert lovborg with his greatcoat on and his hat in his hand tears open the hall door he looks somewhat confused and irritated lovborg looking towards the hall and i tell you i must and will come in there he closes the door turns sees hedda at once regains his self-control and bows hedda at the writing-table well mr lovborg this is rather a late hour to call for thea lovborg you mean rather an early hour to call on you pray pardon me hedda how do you know that she is still here lovborg they told me at her lodgings that she had been out all night hedda going to the oval table did you notice anything about the people of the house when they said that lovborg looks inquiringly at her notice anything about them hedda i mean did they seem to think it odd lovborg suddenly understanding oh yes of course i am dragging her down with me however i didn't notice anything i suppose tesman is not up yet hedda no i think not lovborg when did he come home hedda very late 
Lufborg. did he tell you anything hedda yes i gathered that you had had an exceedingly jolly evening at judge brock's Lufborg. nothing more hedda i don't think so however i was so dreadfully sleepy mrs elvsted enters through the curtains of the middle doorway mrs elvsted going towards him ah oh, Lufborg at last Lufborg, yes at last and too late mrs elvsted looks anxiously at him what is too late Lufborg, everything is too late now it is all over with me mrs elvsted oh no no don't say that Lufborg, you will say the same when you hear mrs elvsted i won't hear anything hedda perhaps you would prefer to talk to her alone if so i will leave you Lufborg, no stay you too i beg you to stay mrs elvsted yes but i won't hear anything i tell you Lufborg, it is not last night's adventures that i want to talk about mrs elvsted what is it then Lufborg, i want to say that now our ways must part mrs elvsted part hedda involuntarily i knew it Lufborg, you can be of no more service to me thea mrs elvsted how can you stand there and say that no more service to you am i not to help you now as before are we not to go on working together Lufborg, henceforward i shall do no work mrs elvsted despairingly then what am i to do with my life Lufborg, you must try to live your life as if you had never known me mrs elvsted but you know i cannot do that Lufborg, try if you cannot thea you must go home again mrs elvsted in vehement protest never in this world where you are there will i be also i will not let myself be driven away like this i will remain here i will be with you when the book appears hedda half aloud in suspense ah yes the book Lufborg looks at her my book and thea's for that is what it is mrs elvsted yes i feel that it is and that is why i have a right to be with you when it appears i will see with my own eyes how respect and honour pour in upon you afresh and the happiness the happiness oh i must share it with you Lufborg, thea our book will never appear hedda ah mrs elvsted never appear Lufborg, can never appear mrs elvsted in agonized foreboding Lufborg, what have you done with the manuscript hedda looks anxiously at him yes the manuscript mrs elvsted where is it Lufborg, oh thea don't ask me about it mrs elvsted yes yes i will know i demand to be told at once Lufborg, the manuscript well then i have torn the manuscript into a thousand pieces mrs elvsted shrieks oh no no hedda involuntarily but that's not Lufborg looks at her not true you think hedda collecting herself oh well of course since you say so but it sounded so improbable Lufborg it is true all the same mrs elvsted wringing her hands oh god oh god hedda torn his own work to pieces Lufborg, i have torn my own life to pieces so why should i not tear my life work too mrs elvsted and you did this last night Lufborg, yes i tell you tore it into a thousand pieces and scattered them on the fjord far out there there is cool sea-water at any rate let them drift upon it drift with the current and the wind and then presently they will sink deeper and deeper as i shall thea mrs elvsted do you know Lufborg, that what you have done with the book i shall think of it to my dying day as though you had killed a little child Lufborg, yes you are right it is a sort of child murder mrs elvsted how could you then did not the child belong to me too hedda almost inaudibly ah the child mrs elvsted breathing heavily it is all over then well well now i will go hedda hedda but you are not going away from town mrs elvsted 
oh i don't know what i shall do i see nothing but darkness before me she goes out by the hall door hedda stands waiting for a moment so you are not going to see her home mr lovborg lovborg i through the streets would you have people see her walking with me hedda of course i don't know what else may have happened last night but is it so utterly irretrievable lovborg it will not end with last night i know that perfectly well and the thing is that now i have no taste for that sort of life either i won't begin it anew she has broken my courage and my power of braving life out hedda looking straight before her so that pretty little fool has had her fingers in a man's destiny looks at him but all the same how could you treat her so heartlessly lovborg oh don't say that it was heartless hedda to go and destroy what has filled her whole soul for months and years you do not call that heartless lovborg to you i can tell the truth hedda hedda the truth lovborg first promise me give me your word that what i now confide to you thea shall never know hedda i give you my word lovborg good then let me tell you that what i said just now was untrue hedda about the manuscript lovborg yes i have not torn it to pieces nor thrown it into the fjord hedda no no but where is it then lovborg i have destroyed it none the less utterly destroyed it hedda hedda i don't understand lovborg thea said that what i had done seemed to her like a child murder hedda yes so she said lovborg but to kill his child that is not the worst thing a father can do to it hedda not the worst lovborg no i wanted to spare thea from hearing the worst hedda then what is the worst lovborg suppose now hedda that a man in the small hours of the morning came home to his child's mother after a night of riot and debauchery and said listen i have been here and there in this place and in that and i have taken our child with me to this place and to that and i have lost the child utterly lost it the devil knows into what hands it may have fallen who may have had their clutches on it hedda well but when all is said and done you know this was only a book lovborg thea's pure soul was in that book hedda yes so i understand lovborg and you can understand too that for her and me together no future is possible hedda what path do you mean to take then lovborg none i will only try to make an end of it all the sooner the better hedda a step nearer him eilert lovborg listen to me will you not try to to do it beautifully lovborg beautifully smiling with vine leaves in my hair as you used to dream in the old days hedda no no i have lost my faith in the vine leaves but beautifully nevertheless for once in a way good-bye you must go now and do not come here any more lovborg good-bye mrs tesman and give george tesman my love he is on the point of going hedda no wait i must give you a memento to take with you she goes to the writing-table and opens the drawer and the pistol-case then returns to lovborg with one of the pistols lovborg looks at her this is this the memento hedda nodding slowly do you recognize it it was aimed at you once lovborg you should have used it then hedda take it and do you use it now lovborg puts the pistol in his breast pocket thanks hedda and beautifully eilert lovborg promise me that lovborg good-bye hedda gobbler he goes out by the hall door hedda listens for a moment at the door then she goes up to the writing-table takes out the packet of manuscript peeps under the cover draws a few of the sheets half out and looks at them next she goes over and seats herself in the armchair beside the stove with a packet in her lap presently she opens the stove door and then the packet hedda throws one of the choirs into the fire and whispers to herself now i am burning your child thea burning it curly locks throwing one or two more choirs into the stove 
your child and eilert lovborg's throws the rest in i am burning i am burning your child end of act three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act Four of Hedda Gobbler by Henrik Ibsen, translated by Edmund Gosse, eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight, and William Archer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Four. The same rooms at the Tesmans. It is evening. The drawing room is in darkness. The back room is lighted by the hanging lamp over the table the curtains over the glass door are drawn close hedda dressed in black walks to and fro in the dark room then she goes into the back room and disappears for a moment to the left she is heard to strike a few chords on the piano presently she comes in sight again and returns to the drawing-room berta enters from the right through the inner room with a lighted lamp which she places on the table in front of the corner settee in the drawing-room her eyes are red with weeping and she has black ribbons in her cap she goes quietly and circumspectly out to the right hedda goes up to the glass door lifts the curtain a little aside and looks out into the darkness shortly afterwards miss tesman in mourning with a bonnet and veil on comes in from the hall hedda goes towards her and holds out her hand miss tesman yes hedda here i am in mourning and forlorn for now my poor sister has at last found peace hedda i have heard the news already as you see tesman sent me a card miss tesman yes he promised me he would but nevertheless i thought that to hedda here in the house of life i ought myself to bring the tidings of death hedda that was very kind of you miss tesman ah rena ought not to have left us just now this is not the time for hedda's house to be a house of mourning hedda changing the subject she died quite peacefully did she not miss tesman miss tesman oh her end was so calm so beautiful and then she had the unspeakable happiness of seeing george once more and bidding him good-bye has he not come home yet hedda no he wrote that he might be detained but won't you sit down miss tesman no thank you my dear dear hedda i should like to but i have so much to do i must prepare my dear one for her rest as well as i can she shall go to her grave looking her best hedda can i not help you in any way miss tesman oh you must not think of it hedda tesman must have no hand in such mournful work nor let her thoughts dwell on it either not at this time hedda one is not always mistress of one's thoughts miss tesman continuing ah yes it is the way of the world at home we shall be sewing a shroud and here there will soon be sewing too i suppose but of another sort thank god george tesman enters by the hall door hedda ah you have come at last tesman you here aunt julia with hedda fancy that miss tesman i was just going my dear boy well have you done all you promised tesman no i'm really afraid i've forgotten half of it i must come to you again to-morrow to-day my brain is all in a whirl i can't keep my thoughts together miss tesman why my dear george you mustn't take it in this way tesman mustn't how do you mean miss tesman even in your sorrow you must rejoice as i do rejoice that she is at rest tesman oh yes yes you are thinking of aunt rena hedda you will feel lonely now miss tesman miss tesman just at first yes but that will not last very long i hope i dare say i shall soon find an occupant for poor rena's little room tesman indeed who do you think will take it eh miss tesman oh there's always some poor invalid or other in want of nursing unfortunately hedda would you really take such a burden upon you again miss tesman a burden heaven forgive you child it has been no burden to me hedda but suppose you had a total stranger on your hands miss tesman oh one soon makes friends with sick folk 
and it's such an absolute necessity for me to have someone to live for well heaven be praised there may soon be something in this house too to keep an old aunt busy hedda oh don't trouble about anything here tesman yes just fancy what a nice time we three might have together if hedda if tesman uneasily oh nothing it will all come right let us hope so eh miss tesman well well i dare say you two want to talk to each other smiling and perhaps hedda may have something to tell you too george good-bye i must go home to rena turning at the door how strange it is to think that now rena is with me and with my poor brother as well tesman yes fancy that aunt yulia eh miss tesman goes out by the hall door hedda follows tesman coldly and searchingly with her eyes i almost believe your aunt rena's death affects you more than it does your aunt yulia tesman oh it's not that alone it's eilert i am so terribly uneasy about hedda quickly is there anything new about him tesman i looked in at his rooms this afternoon intending to tell him the manuscript was in safe keeping hedda well did you not find him tesman no he wasn't at home but afterwards i met mrs elfsted and she told me that he had been here early this morning hedda yes directly after you had gone tesman and he said that he had torn his manuscript to pieces eh hedda yes so he declared tesman my good heavens he must have been completely out of his mind and i suppose you thought it best not to give it back to him hedda hedda no he did not get it tesman but of course you told him that we had it hedda no quickly did you tell mrs elfsted tesman no i thought i had better not but you ought to have told him fancy if in desperation he should go and do himself some injury let me have the manuscript hedda i will take it to him at once where is it hedda cold and immovable leaning on the armchair i have not got it tesman have not got it what in the world do you mean hedda i have burnt it every line of it tesman with a violent movement of terror burnt burnt eilert's manuscript hedda don't scream so the servant might hear you tesman burnt why good god no 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 it's impossible hedda it is so nevertheless tesman do you know what you have done hedda it's unlawful appropriation of lost property fancy that just ask judge brock and he'll tell you what it is hedda i advise you not to speak of it either to judge brock or to any one else tesman but how could you do anything so unheard of what put it into your head what possessed you answer me that eh hedda suppressing an almost imperceptible smile i did it for your sake george tesman for my sake hedda this morning when you told me about what he had read to you tesman yes yes what then hedda you acknowledged that you envied him his work tesman oh of course i didn't mean that literally hedda no matter i could not bear the idea that any one should throw you into the shade tesman in an outburst of mingled doubt and joy hedda oh is this true but but i never knew you show your love like that before fancy that hedda well i may as well tell you that just at this time impatiently breaking off no no you can ask aunt yulia she will tell you fast enough tesman oh i almost think i understand you hedda clasped his hands together great heavens do you really mean it eh hedda don't shout so the servant might hear tesman laughing in irrepressible glee the servant why how absurd you are hedda it's only my old berta why i'll tell berta myself hedda clenching her hands together in desperation oh it is killing me it is killing me all this tesman what is hedda eh hedda coldly controlling herself all this absurdity george tesman absurdity do you see anything absurd in my being overjoyed at the news but after all perhaps i had better not say anything to berta hedda 
oh why not that too tesman no no not yet but i must certainly tell aunt yulia and then that you have begun to call me george too fancy that oh aunt yulia will be so happy so happy hedda when she hears that i have burnt eilert lovborg's manuscript for your sake tesman no by the by that affair of the manuscript of course nobody must know about that but that you love me so much hedda aunt yulia must really share my joy in that i wonder now whether this sort of thing is usual in young wives eh hedda i think you'd better ask aunt yulia that question too tesman i will indeed some time or other looks uneasy and downcast again and yet the manuscript the manuscript good god it is terrible to think of what will become of poor eilert now mrs elvsted dressed as in the first act with hat and cloak enters by the hall door mrs elvsted greets them hurriedly and says in evident agitation oh dear hedda forgive my coming again hedda what is the matter with you thea tesman something about eilert lovborg again eh mrs elvsted yes i am dreadfully afraid some misfortune has happened to him hedda seizes her arm ah do you think so tesman why good lord what makes you think that mrs elvsted mrs elvsted i heard them talking of him at my boarding-house just as i came in oh the most incredible rumours are afloat about him to-day tesman yes fancy so i heard too and i can bear witness that he went straight home to bed last night fancy that hedda well what did they say at the boarding-house mrs elvsted oh i couldn't make out anything clearly either they knew nothing definite or else they stopped talking when they saw me and i did not dare to ask tesman moving about uneasily we must hope we must hope that you misunderstood them mrs elvsted mrs elvsted no no i am sure it was of him they were talking and i heard something about the hospital or tesman the hospital hedda no surely that cannot be mrs elvsted oh i was in such mortal terror i went to his lodgings and asked for him there hedda you could make up your mind to that thea mrs elvsted what else could i do i really could bear the suspense no longer tesman but you didn't find him either eh mrs elvsted no and the people knew nothing about him he hadn't been home since yesterday afternoon they said tesman yesterday fancy how could they say that mrs elvsted oh i am sure something terrible must have happened to him tesman hedda dear how would it be if i were to go and make inquiries hedda no no don't you mix yourself up in this affair judge brock with his hat in his hand enters by the hall door which berta opens and closes behind him he looks grave and bows in silence tesman oh is that you my dear judge eh brock yes it was imperative i should see you this evening tesman i can see that you have heard the news about aunt rina brock yes that among other things tesman isn't it sad eh brock well my dear tesman that depends on how you look at it tesman looks doubtfully at him has anything else happened brock yes hedda in suspense anything sad judge brock brock that too depends on how you look at it mrs tesman mrs elvsted unable to restrain her anxiety oh it is something about eilert lovborg brock with a glance at her what makes you think that madam perhaps you have already heard something mrs elvsted in confusion no nothing at all but tesman oh for heaven's sake tell us brock shrugging his shoulders well i regret to say eilert lovborg has been taken to the hospital he is lying at the point of death mrs elvsted shrieks oh god oh god tesman to the hospital and at the point of death hedda involuntarily so soon then mrs elvsted wailing and we parted in anger hedda hedda whispers thea thea be careful mrs elvsted not heeding her i must go to him i must see him alive brock it is useless madam no one will be admitted mrs elvsted 
oh at least tell me what has happened to him what is it tesman you don't mean to say that he has himself eh hedda yes i am sure he has tesman hedda how can you brock keeping his eyes fixed upon her unfortunately you have guessed quite correctly mrs tesman mrs elvsted oh how horrible tesman himself then fancy that hedda shot himself brock rightly guessed again mrs tesman mrs elvsted with an effort at self-control when did it happen mr brock brock this afternoon between three and four tesman but good lord where did he do it eh brock with some hesitation where well i suppose at his lodgings mrs elvsted no that cannot be for i was there between six and seven brock well then somewhere else i don't know exactly i only know that he was found he had shot himself in the breast mrs elvsted oh how terrible that he should die like that hedda to brock was it in the breast brock yes as i told you hedda not in the temple brock in the breast mrs tesman hedda well well the breast is a good place too brock how do you mean mrs tesman hedda evasively oh nothing nothing tesman and the wound is dangerous you say eh brock absolutely mortal the end has probably come by this time mrs elvsted yes yes i feel it the end the end oh hedda tesman but tell me how have you learnt all this brock curtly through one of the police a man i had some business with hedda in a clear voice at last a deed worth doing tesman terrified good heavens hedda what are you saying hedda i say there is beauty in this brock hm mrs tesman tesman beauty fancy that mrs elvsted oh hedda how can you talk of beauty in such an act hedda eilert lovborg has himself made up his account with life he has had the courage to do the one right thing mrs elvsted no you must never think that was how it happened it must have been in delirium that he did it tesman in despair hedda that he did not i am certain of that mrs elvsted yes yes in delirium just as when he tore up our manuscript brock starting the manuscript has he torn that up mrs elvsted yes last night tesman whispers softly oh hedda we shall never get over this brock hm very extraordinary tesman moving about the room to think of eilert going out of the world in this way and not leaving behind him the book that would have immortalized his name mrs elvsted oh if only it could be put together again tesman yes if it only could i don't know what i would not give mrs elvsted perhaps it can mr tesman tesman what do you mean mrs elvsted searches in the pocket of her dress look here i have kept all the loose notes he used to dictate from hedda a step forward ah tesman you have kept them mrs elvsted eh mrs elvsted yes i have them here i put them in my pocket when i left home here they still are tesman oh do let me see them mrs elvsted hands him a bundle of papers but they are in such disorder all mixed up tesman fancy if we could make something out of them after all perhaps if we two put our heads together mrs elvsted oh yes at least let us try tesman we will manage it we must i will dedicate my life to this task hedda you george your life tesman yes or rather all the time i can spare my own collections must wait in the meantime hedda you understand eh i owe this to eilert's memory hedda perhaps tesman and so my dear mrs elvsted we will give our whole minds to it there is no use in brooding over what can't be undone eh we must try to control our grief as much as possible and mrs elvsted yes yes mr tesman i will do the best i can tesman 
well then come here i can't rest until we have looked through the notes where shall we sit here no in there in the back room excuse me my dear judge come with me mrs elvsted mrs elvsted oh if only it were possible tesman and mrs elvsted go into the back room she takes off her hat and cloak they both sit at the table under the hanging lamp and are soon deep in an eager examination of the papers hedda crosses to the stove and sits in the armchair presently brock goes up to her hedda in a low voice oh what a sense of freedom it gives one this act of eilert lovborg's brock freedom mrs hedda well of course it is a release for him hedda i mean for me it gives me a sense of freedom to know that a deed of deliberate courage is still possible in this world a deed of spontaneous beauty brock smiling hm my dear mrs hedda hedda oh i know what you are going to say for you are a kind of specialist too like you know brock looking hard at her eilert lovborg was more to you than perhaps you are willing to admit to yourself am i wrong hedda i don't answer such questions i only know that eilert lovborg has had the courage to live his life after his own fashion and then the last great act with its beauty ah that he should have the will and the strength to turn away from the banquet of life so early brock i am sorry mrs hedda but i fear i must dispel an amiable illusion hedda illusion brock which could not have lasted long in any case hedda what do you mean brock eilert lovborg did not shoot himself voluntarily hedda not voluntarily brock no the thing did not happen exactly as i told it hedda in suspense have you concealed something what is it brock for poor mrs elvsted's sake i idealize the facts a little hedda what are the facts brock first that he is already dead hedda at the hospital brock yes without regaining consciousness hedda what more have you concealed brock this the event did not happen at his lodgings hedda oh that can make no difference brock perhaps it may for i must tell you eilert lovborg was found shot in in mademoiselle diana's boudoir hedda makes a motion as if to rise but sinks back again that is impossible judge brock he cannot have been there again to-day brock he was there this afternoon he went there he said to demand the return of something which they had taken from him talked wildly about a lost child hedda ah so that was why brock i thought probably he meant his manuscript but now i hear he destroyed that himself so i suppose it must have been his pocket-book hedda yes no doubt and there there he was found brock yes there with a pistol in his breast pocket discharged the ball had lodged in a vital part hedda in the breast yes brock no in the bowels hedda looks up at him with an expression of loathing that too oh what curse is it that makes everything i touch turn ludicrous and mean brock there is one point more mrs hedda another disagreeable feature in the affair hedda and what is that brock the pistol he carried hedda breathless well what of it brock he must have stolen it hedda leaps up stolen it that is not true he did not steal it brock no other explanation is possible he must have stolen it hush tesman and mrs elvsted have risen from the table in the back room and come into the drawing-room tesman with the papers in both his hands hedda dear it is almost impossible to see under that lamp think of that hedda yes i am thinking tesman would you mind our sitting at your writing-table eh hedda if you like quickly no wait let me clear it first tesman oh you needn't trouble hedda there is plenty of room hedda no no let me clear it i say i will take these things in and put them on the piano there she has drawn out an object covered with sheet music from under the bookcase places several other pieces of music upon it 
and carries the whole into the inner room to the left tesman lays the scraps of paper on the writing-table and moves the lamp there from the corner table he and mrs elvsted sit down and proceed with their work hedda returns hedda behind mrs elvsted's chair gently ruffling her hair well my sweet thea how goes it with eilert lovborg's monument mrs elvsted looks dispiritedly up at her oh it will be terribly hard to put in order tesman we must manage it i am determined and arranging other people's papers is just the work for me hedda goes over to the stove and seats herself on one of the footstools brock stands over her leaning on the armchair hedda whispers what did you say about the pistol brock softly that he must have stolen it hedda why stolen it brock because every other explanation ought to be impossible mrs hedda hedda indeed brock glances at her of course eilert lovborg was here this morning was he not hedda yes brock were you alone with him hedda part of the time brock did you not leave the room whilst he was here hedda no brock try to recollect were you not out of the room a moment hedda oh, yes perhaps just a moment out in the hall brock and where was your pistol case during that time hedda i had it locked up in brock well mrs hedda hedda the case stood there on the writing-table brock have you looked since to see whether both the pistols are there hedda no brock well you need not i saw the pistol found in lovborg's pocket and i knew it at once as the one i had seen yesterday and before too hedda have you it with you brock no the police have it hedda what will the police do with it brock search till they find the owner hedda do you think they will succeed brock bends over her and whispers no hedda gobbler not so long as i say nothing hedda looks frightened at him and if you do not say nothing what then brock shrugs his shoulders there is always the possibility that the pistol was stolen hedda firmly death rather than that brock smiling people say such things but they don't do them hedda without replying and supposing the pistol was not stolen and the owner is discovered what then brock well hedda then comes the scandal hedda the scandal brock yes the scandal of which you are so mortally afraid you will of course be brought before the court both you and mademoiselle diana she will have to explain how the thing happened whether it was an accidental shot or murder did the pistol go off as he was trying to take it out of his pocket to threaten her with or did she tear the pistol out of his hand shoot him and push it back into his pocket that would be quite like her for she is an able-bodied young person this same mademoiselle diana hedda but i have nothing to do with all this repulsive business brock no but you will have to answer the question why did you give eilert lovborg the pistol and what conclusions will people draw from the fact that you did give it to him hedda lets her head sink that is true i did not think of that brock well fortunately there is no danger so long as i say nothing hedda looks up at him so i am in your power judge brock you have me at your beck and call from this time forward brock whispers softly dearest hedda believe me i shall not abuse my advantage hedda i am in your power none the less subject to your will and your demands a slave a slave then rises impetuously no i cannot endure the thought of that never brock looks half mockingly at her people generally get used to the inevitable hedda returns his look yes perhaps she crosses to the writing-table suppressing an involuntary smile she imitates tesman's intonations well are you getting on george eh tesman heaven knows dear in any case it will be the work of months hedda as before fancy that passes her hand softly through mrs elvsted's hair doesn't it seem strange to you thea here are you sitting with tesman just as you used to sit with eilert lovborg 
mrs elvsted ah if i could only inspire your husband in the same way hedda oh that will come too in time tesman yes do you know hedda i really think i begin to feel something of the sort but won't you go and sit with brock again hedda is there nothing i can do to help you two tesman no nothing in the world turning his head i trust to you to keep hedda company my dear brock brock with a glance at hedda with the very greatest of pleasure hedda thanks but i am tired this evening i will go in and lie down a little on the sofa tesman yes do dear eh hedda goes into the back room and draws the curtains a short pause suddenly she is heard playing a wild dance on the piano mrs elvsted starts from her chair oh what is that tesman runs to the doorway why my dearest hedda don't play dance music to-night just think of aunt rena and of eilert too hedda puts her head out between the curtains and of aunt yulia and of all the rest of them after this i will be quiet closes the curtains again tesman at the writing-table it's not good for her to see us at this distressing work i'll tell you what mrs elvsted you shall take the empty room at aunt yulia's and then i will come over in the evenings and we can sit and work there eh hedda in the inner room i hear what you are saying tesman but how am i to get through the evenings out here tesman turning over the papers oh i dare say judge brock will be so kind as to look in now and then even though i am out brock in the armchair calls out gaily every blessed evening with all the pleasure in life mrs tesman we shall get on capitally together we two hedda speaking loud and clear yes don't you flatter yourself we will judge brock now that you are the one cock in the basket a shot is heard within tesman mrs elvsted and brock leap to their feet tesman oh now she is playing with those pistols again she throws back the curtains and runs in followed by mrs elvsted hedda lies stretched on the sofa lifeless confusion and cries berta enters in alarm from the right tesman shrieks to brock shot herself shot herself in the temple fancy that brock half fainting in the armchair good god people don't do such things end of act four recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of hedda gobbler by henrik ibsen translated by edmund gossie eighteen forty nine to nineteen twenty eight and william archer